Well, it would appear that that's another technical problem conquered. We should have enough bandwidth available for YouTube viewers now. However, if you do experience um, extreme amounts of buffering and lag and low frame rates, of course, I invite you to check out my Twitch channel, Twitch TV slash BR Brainerd, and uh, you'll experience um, less lag there if you do end up having it on YouTube during the stream tonight. So this is actually uh, take two for those of you who are uh, just joining me now. Uh, let's go back to where we left off. Uh, the last time we streamed Torment Tides of Numenera. Now. So, we are back in Sega's Cliffs. We are in um, Circus Minor sure in the marketplace, not far from where we uh, entered from the Reef of Fallen Worlds. Um, we haven't taken much opportunity to talk to the merchants and the various NPCs available around the city simply because um, there was a public execution happening here. We've resolved that circumstance and uh, Tiber has joined us as one of our faithful companions. So first, I would like to head over here to this merchant stall and let's talk to Felinda. Nearly every inch of this merchant's body is covered in tightly wound robes and furs. A hood obscures its head, and a mask conceals its face. This doesn't stop you from noticing that it is apparently furious with you. Trembling, it bats at its similarly dressed companion. Both of them turn impassive masks back to you. Neither Felinda nor Steristi could believe it, but the thief had come back. Had he come in shame, ready to return what he had taken? No. His hands were empty, his expression baffled. Felinda's crosses swaddled arms. Perhaps the thief had simply forgotten to return what he had borrowed, but this made him no less a thief. Are you narrating me? The thief said, trying to distract Felinda from the matter at hand, but the merchant would not be distracted. Scan thoughts. Besides, the merchant had been asked this question many times. Ten years ago, this thief had borrowed a book. Felinda wondered if the scoundrel was possibly unfamiliar with the definition of the word. It did not mean taking a thing and keeping it, after all. Zeristi pointedly returns to work, ignoring you both. Felinda sighs, massaging its temples with gloved hands. But in the end, Felinda took a deep, deep breath and asked the thief to simply return the sealed and long overdue book with the five-colored sigil on its cover. Can you possibly remember who borrowed a book from you ten years ago? The cunning thief said, hoping to arouse doubt in Felinda's mind. But it was a foolish one. Felinda was memory, in the same way that the thief was fatty tissue, fluids, and chunks of calcium. The merchant crosses its arms. Felinda was out of patience. Was the thief going to return the book or not? I'll find the book. You have my word. The thief declared, and Felinda was satisfied. Temporarily. And with that, the merchant returns to its work as well. Why do you narrate everything I say? Felinda responds by saying, the thief said. But Felinda knew from long experience that there was no explaining it. The merchant kneels before a bookshelf and jams book after book into the remaining space. This frustrated Felinda. After all, the two merchants were creatures of words, bound in metal and cloth, but whenever Felinda tried to bend these same words into explanations and answers, they crumbled and fell apart. They could not fold themselves around the truth. The merchant slams a final book into place. And so Felinda said nothing. And once again, Felinda was exonerated. The thief knew he was a thief. I don't think there's anywhere further we can go by investigating more, so say Making farewell for now. And we have a quest to retrieve this book that yes. apparently our progenitor no. borrowed. I'm curious about uh, Sturitsi, her companion. The silent merchant traces dark fingers over a cracked scroll. It appears to be ignoring you, as politely as possible. So he doesn't seem to bear us quite the same animosity as uh, his companion. Perhaps we can get a little bit more information by asking why is your partner narrating me? Either ignores us or does not hear us. Why don't you talk? Let's watch him work instead. Words don't seem to be getting us very far. 
The merchant's spread-fingered hands glide over a faded parchment with the faint sounds of quills scratching. Vibrant letters in an unfamiliar tongue appear in their wake. The merchant again passes a hand over the page, and you hear the scrape of quill on paper. Dark letters emerge from the shadows of that hand, as if pulled from beneath the page. Okay. There's another character that I want to speak to up sure here, enough. one who calls himself the Genocide. It's quite a name. I think he has an interesting story for us. This burly, armor-clad figure stands almost motionless as you approach. He regards you silently through his singular eye. The studs on his arms and the blades on his shoulders are stained and pitted with age. When he speaks, his voice is muffled and artificial, a hollow grumble that emanates from the entirety of the helmet. I am the genocide. If you ask, I must answer. Pass on, then, and exchange no words. His surface thoughts are like a crystal pool, alternatively transparent, or else perfectly reflecting his words. His mind reveals nothing hidden, except for a low-level hatred of everything around him. This latter is more a feeling you get than an actual thought that you can hear. You said you had to answer if I asked. Why? From within the helmet, you hear a grinding noise, the sound of teeth gnashing, amplified. Then the voice again. Bleak. We sat at the river's edge, and we wept for the time that was. We saw nothing more to conquer, and yet our fear still drove us. We had conquered the land, purged its impurities, and made it ours. Still we wanted more. When we heard that humans had come to carve a home, we rejoiced to have a new foe, a new test of our truth. We rose. We rode against them. We drove them to the forge of the night sky, to the valley of Marjolios, to the dangers of the Black Riage. But those who built the top of these ruins, they thwarted us, time and again. So we brought our constructs and our deadliest warriors to the bay outside the city. We laid a mighty siege. We entered the human settlement. We fought past barricades and traps. Some of our constructs are still here, silent and dead. But when we thought we had achieved our greatest victory, a powerful nano saved them. With his magics, he called upon the strength of the ancients and captured us. I thought my life was at an end. But he imprisoned me, in slow time, trapped me in my body, used machines to paralyze my will. I still remember our glories, and I see the faded future in front of me, and I am powerless to act. The memories of our triumphs remain always at the forefront of my mind, and I must answer the mocking questions of these people, or suffer. You seem very calm for someone who has been imprisoned for centuries. I have been defeated. I have nothing to fight for. My captor castrated me with a tool they made to dampen my natural urges. I can remember the actions, I can recall the glory, but I feel shame, regret. I am weakened, but not by my volition. The genocide squeezes his fists. What does it matter? Those who stood against me are all dead. I am victorious. I no longer fight with the blade. My weapon is time. He leans in closer. I do not die. I cannot be wounded. I am held like a beetle in sap. Why would I not be serene? He settles back. The underspine spoke of my destiny. I was to wage war unto the end of the universe, but the universe keeps going, and so, it seems, must I. Someday I will be free. Someday. Until then, I am incorruptible. What are you? I am a blade that cannot cut, a weapon that cannot strike, a living monument to failure. He shifts his weight. You hear the frown in his voice. I was a guesty Delcote, the firm hand of tradition. They called me one of the Black Three. Enemies did not understand us. They took my name to mean death in a dozen extinct tongues and called me Orphan Maker, Hope Smasher, Death's Child. My armies blackened the earth and the skies. My dragolus scoured the land. Domination was my duty. If they had known, if they had welcomed us, they might have been our thralls. Instead, they became dust. He gestures, all this. It was to have been mine and stewardship for the future of my people. It was promised. But now, his arm falls back to his side. Now I am the genocide, a relic. 
the last of my kind. You said you were the last of your kind. Why? I know of no others. Kaglath Anvor, he who shares truth and understanding, is dead. Vostalith Lo, the blinding light of reason, was destroyed. The Underspine has fallen. My people are destroyed utterly, and our servant God speaks to us no longer. The clean lines of order and the glory of battle have forsaken us. He pauses. The rest are dust. We rose against a superior foe and were outmatched. Only I remain to tell the story of the Tabat. You mentioned the Tabat. Who or what were they? My people, his voice is forlorn. Great warriors. We owned this land. We served the Underspine and it served us. We sought truth and victory. We ascended to epiphany. We were pure, incorruptible, indivisible, even in disunity. We found strength in one another and proved it with bloody blades. But we fell, and the underspine fell. And so, too late, we learned a new truth. But I carry the old ways as a seed within my heart. You mentioned the names of some Tibat. Can you tell me about them? Kalagat Anvor, the strongest mind of the Black Three. None could stand before him when he bent his mind to their unraveling. Intricate, careful, overwhelming. Vostalith Lo, a methodical planner, collector of curiosities, the toolsmith, and construct waker. It was he who brought the ancient machines to life. And I, the knife, the strategist, the blade in their hand. We three were unstoppable. He pauses. Until Sega's cliffs. Until then. Until the corruption of defeat. Why did the Tabat fight so much? For honor. For truth. For the one way. Because it was our duty. We were born to the blade, so it was written. So we chose. Free will is a curse, unless given to a greater purpose. Our purpose was given to us by the Underspine, given to the Underspine by our ancestors who found it and crystallized our essence forever. Can you tell me more about the Underspine? Our slave, our god, our prize. It kept us holy, kept us pure and unchanging, anchored to a fixed point. The world turned around us, but we remained constant. When the world brought inconstancy, we fed it blood. He pauses. The underspine was our soul, our confessor. We knew clean, hard rapture from it. We knew our path. It gave us the words of the ancient Tabat, and our path was rigid and unbending, absolute. Ask again, what was the underspine? You would not understand. It was a machine. It was stone. It was a cavern. It was a city. It was the direct voice of our ancestors. It spoke in our heads, and in our ears, and in our hearts. We heard its voice in our crushes, in our daily instructions. Our God was true and strong and singular, not the fickle and constant things of the modern day. So here we have a whole culture <laughs> built around a Numenera rather than a series of them. Described as a servant god, it must have been particularly powerful. Um, one that was capable of organizing the thoughts and uh, the ancestry of an entire race. Um, and yet was described as a servant. I don't know if we'll ever get the opportunity to see it firsthand, but the bot are ancient history already to Sega's Cliffs, centuries before um, they attempted to attack the city, and now the genocide appears to be the only member left. What happened to the Underspine? You can hear the frown in his voice. Sabotage or failure. One of those under my command told me it had whispered defeat into his ears, as if it had sickened, lost sight of the true path. Given the question, the underspine denied this. My soldier was cast out, and I suffered the barb for his doubt. It was later, years later, that the underspine broke, after our failure, and I have never been sure if the seeds for our defeat were planted in those days. He shuffles his feet. The nano who captured me, who nailed me to time, he used the Mind Seer to ferret out the Underspine's location. I do not know if he ever found it in the world. He raped a genocide from me, and mocked me with a superkite. I was not to blame. 
I will stand before the underspine and swear my innocence. What is the benefit of an absolute path? We had no questions about our duty, about our goals, only the particulars. We erased doubts in the purity of utter certainty. Questions raised are questions answered, and they are heresy. No need for self-agony. The necessity of introspection was transmuted into optimization of our paths, into fashioning ourselves into the pinnacle of our achievement. Clear definition in life creates truth, not this pitiful shadow. Let me ask about something else. So we can already guess at the identity of who made this happen, but let's ask. Can you tell me about the nano who trapped you here? How did he stop you? The genocide raises his hands in defeat. He found old knowledge and made it his own. He created defenses that we could not penetrate. Most telling, most effective, the shield generators. He created three barriers around the heart of the city, and the last unmoored the city in time. When our constructs touched it, they flashed to stasis. We could not reach the city, but the city could reach us. You feel the ticklings of memory as the genocide speaks of the shields. He continues to talk, oblivious. Let's let the memory come. It's Apache memory, coming in still images and moments. The relentless beat of the war machines as they approach the city, the reavers in the sky of their dirigibles. You remember fighting them on the parapet. You remember fleeing into safety of the city. You recall making your way to the shield generators, cutting off the Tabat supply lines. And then the memory fades. The genocide watches you slightly, silently. You know, I wonder if that memory we encountered in the calm a while back, if you recall one of three um, when we were escaping, talked about a burning city, we were up there on the walls of the city, there was a large, tall person in the foreground and a more dangerous person wielding a sharp knife in the background. That might have been of Sega's Cliffs. How did they stop you from trying to escape? The nano who raised the city shields created a device. He called it the Mind Seer. With it, he violated my mind, my memories, and everything that was at the core of my being. In a fit of vengeance, he tore truths from me. He made me betray my people. He rewrote my mind. He gave me perfect clarity into the past and gelded my ability to shape the future. It's quite vindictive. The Dabat never sought revenge against foes who were mightier than we. We devised stratagems to defeat them. We tested ourselves. We did not punish or hate. Punishment was purification. This, though, is torture. The worst of the city's refuse can mock me now. They can ridicule and jape, and I am powerless to strike them for their impudence. Then quieter. And now they do not even do that. I have become a fixture, an irrelevance, a non-entity. I am the slave, too. You hear his teeth grinding as he thinks of the perfect insult to peacemakers. I must endure their presence and feel their corruption sink into me daily. Some foreign part of me desires it. He thumps his fist into his hand. But I remember that I will triumph over them. Eventually, they will die, and I will not. The nano who defeated you was the changing god. He and his children still live. His voice is flat and dead. Others have claimed this. I do not know if they say this to torment me. But if our enemy was a god, even if he was once but a man, and to stand against him is to spit in the face of the divine, the Dabat were a holy people. Humans do not believe it, but our rights were sacred to us, and they were profane to your kind. We accepted the will of the ineffable. Any who still live may yet find the mantle of godhood. To be divined is to be beyond the rule of, moral, of mortal ethics. Those who would be gods must cast aside these concerns if they are to turn against the old teachings. I think one of the most interesting parts of this story is the character of the changing god. Um, a man himself, through mastery of the Numenera, was able to defeat an entire seemingly unstoppable wave of uh, an entire military uh, by manipulating time. We'll have the opportunity to investigate some of the generators um, within the city later, in fact uh, rather soon, but I'd like to consider for a moment the character of the changing god. Once mortal, but with tremendous amount of power, and we can see also more than that, 
what he has done to the genocide here, how he has reduced him. Um, his was warlike people. The genocide was one of the most warlike among them. He was a warrior specialist within a warrior race. And um, instead of killing him, uh, the changing god has trapped him here as a sort of tour guide um, to be sneered at by passers-by for all eternity. Truly a fate worse than death for a man like this. And as he explains, you know, his people were stormtroopers, so to speak. They lived for war. Um, and uh, hated peace, but as he said before, they would never have done something like this to somebody. You know, they accepted the will of the ineffable. They are able to accept defeat. Whereas the changing god, uh, in his vengeance, committed something far more terrible. You mentioned the shield generators. Can you tell me about them? I told you their effect. They unmoored the city in time. They severed our supply lines. They left us vulnerable and defeated us. The Underspine strategy failed us. I began to doubt. The Underspine is sounding more and more like a sort of st strategic supercomputer. But it seems to be more than that. It contains memories, or at least perhaps the personalities of their ancestors, and seems to have a minor ability to look into the future, perhaps. He shifts slightly. The generators are unused, abandoned, their purpose forgotten. Though the people of the city still swear by our, by our name, and our terrors are fresh in their nightmares despite the passage of centuries, and it has been centuries he's been trapped here, they have forgotten the means of their salvation. This one beside me no longer functions, but one of the others is buried in the ground not far from here, and has not yet failed. It powers the clock around which those ridiculous fools prance. He's talking about the cult of the changing god. So. This is one of the more interesting stories around the city, and we have exhausted uh, most of what he has to say. So, take our leave for now. So, we spoke to him yes. for a yeah. reason. I wanted to get a little bit of background on I'm the going. places that we have visited so far. The next place that we're going to go to... Of course. So we need to find our way to a bar known as the Fifth Eye. And I believe it is to be found... Uh, here. But I'm going to check our map real quick. So we're in Government Square. Out into the underbelly. Hmm. Perhaps not. Let's head over to the northeast up here. There we were before with the Order of Truth. Let's see what's in here. So yes. this over here leads to Caravan Sarai, I believe. And I think, actually, I think it's on Cliff's Edge, if memory serves. So we're going to head through this area to reach Cliff's Edge to get to the Go. bar. We have to go this way. Not this bar, mind you. Like any RPG worth its salt, I think there are three, right. I want to say. It's like it's close. Oh, into its history there. There were several inside of Sigil back in Planescape Torment as well. Fine. Yes, okay, so we now find ourselves in Cliff's Edge. Lots of interesting Numenera to examine, yes. but I would like to head here. Take a look at this place with all the eyes out in front of it. There are a couple of memory of Vera goons. We're not exactly in the nice part of town here, but you do have to, admit it, uh, to admire the sort of street art here. Let's take a look. The mural above the door depicts five people. Their positioning suggesting trust and camaraderie. Let's head inside. Ready. So this is perhaps my favorite area in all of Sega's Cliffs. Um, there are some incredible stories here. There's O, who some of you might recognize. I'm going to save meeting him uh, for later. Um, Almas, the Soul Keeper, we can speak to. Somebody else named Sug. As and you I wish. think 
over here, there's a ghostly woman. So this whole area is kind of blurry and indistinct. Um, and we can learn more about it, uh, but for now, let's see what's going on here. You draw closer, but the wispy form of the woman in the booth does not clarify. You can hardly discern the details of her ghostly face, and you hear a chorus of whispering female voices that swarm around her like chance moths. Let's listen to the whispers. They brush against your mind just below the level of conscious thought. You hear them, but not with your ears. You can only make out snatches of the whispers in your mind. You killed me. Let's ask her who she is. Who are you? She has been ignoring you, but, without a transitional state, her face is suddenly and furiously focused on yours. Another flicker and her hands wrap around your throat. Ghost or not, her fingers are very real, and they're choking the life from you. <laughs> so, my companions, we just met, not exactly stepping up to the plate here to help out, are they? Um, we can try to escape, but this the beginning of this quest is a little funny. Um, we've been taught at the beginning of the game, particularly from that obelisk in the Reef of Fallen Worlds, if you recall, the one where if you uh, do not retract your hand quickly, it will just straight up kill you. Um, so we've been taught that it's realistic somewhat, that um, it's more of a simulationist type of RPG, and that you need to play clever and smart. You can be a good guy if you want, you can do good things. But lawful stupid doesn't make its way very far in a game like this. So, you should probably want to try to escape in this situation, right? You should probably want to spend basically all your might to try and do it. But it turns out that the right decision in this circumstance is actually just to let yourself be strangled. It's a little weird. Her fingers dig deeper. She's not just compressing your trachea, she's tearing your throat out. You choke and cough, drowning on your blood, but she is latched inside you, and the last thing you see is her rage twisted face. I can't... can't die. So, this is our first death in the series so far, I believe, and it's been a voluntary one. We get to see what happens when we die. Like, um, the nameless one from the previous game, death does not appear to have the same hold over us as it might over others. We've woken up in a strange place. You can see pieces of the landscape are appearing and disappearing out of the void here. Seems to be some sort of um, nebula in the distance. But here in front of us is a ghostly woman. I wonder if it's the same ghostly woman we just saw before. It's the same ghostly woman who strangled you. But the fury is gone from her face, replaced with confusion. She looks around. Her gaze falls on the large machine and lingers there. Finally, she notices you. She steps forward, a hint of trepidation in her eyes. Where are we? Do you know? She thinks, how do I know that machine? It frightens me, and I don't know why. I think we're in the labyrinth, a construct of my mind. Of your mind? But it feels familiar to me. She looks around again, frowning. But even though it feels familiar, I recognize almost nothing in it. Yes, perhaps it is your mind, after all. I do remember one thing. She puts her hands to the sides of her head. I was angry, enraged. There are... I don't know how, but there are women like me born throughout the city, repeatedly, against their will. She thinks my memories are flitting back to me like flies. What drove them away? What do you mean? They are compelled into existence, she bites her lips, uncertain. Then she nods, I'm just a memory, but something is forcing my memory into the minds of women throughout the city. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Direct quote. I heard that a lot in Planescape. The ghostly woman takes your hand in hers. It's wrong. I don't know how I know, but she looks away, lost in her own thoughts. When she turns back to you, there is more certainty in her voice. Find them. The women becoming like me, or already like me. Maybe I'll remember more. Maybe, maybe we can do something. How do I find these women? They're in the real world, in Sega's. You may have even met them without realizing it. I only have vague impressions of them. I know that one of them is a leader. She has sacrificed much of her life, and so gained life in return. She shakes her head as though to clear it. I'm sorry I can't tell you more than that. Do you have any more impressions of where I might find these women? 
One of them offers joy and sorrow for coin. Her family is not her own. It's borrowed, I think. She shakes her head as though to clear it. I'm sorry, I can't tell you more than that. Farewell. Don't forget, we must know more, she says. Let's take a look at the labyrinth. The machine she referenced is here, one that appears to be forcing the memory of herself into the bodies of some of the women around town. Go. Um, let's take a closer look. The air is warm next to this machine, and you feel dizzy wherever you go near it. We can tell that we're in a sort of crossroads inside the labyrinth here, um, with imagery fading in and out to in all in three directions. The only way we can go for now is all this right. way to leave the area. And once again, we find ourselves back in the calm. Am I glad you came out of that door? The thing just showed up. I didn't know what to expect. Something feels odd about this man, but it takes a while to put your finger on it. It's his thoughts. They aren't there, or rather they're there, but they're indistinct. A kind of white noise that blends in too well with the background hush of this place. Do you know who the ghostly woman is in that fathom? The specter shakes his head. Don't know anything about that one. That way is blocked. He shrugs. It's not surprising, really. It's your mind, not mine. Most likely she's just a lacuna, a construct of your buried memories. Either that or she's a reflection of someone you met in real life. Whoever or whatever she is, she probably isn't real. You're the only one with that distinction, he chuckles to himself, and me by extension. I found the resonance chamber, but it's broken. Yeah, I saw that. I don't see everything you do out there in the world, but I definitely saw that. You have to find a way to fix it. Your thoughts are fuzzy. Why can't I read them? The specter's voice is dry, but his smile takes some of the sting from his words. I imagine it's because we're in a place of pure thought. I'm a construct of pure thought, and that our conversation is taking place on the level of thoughts. Most things here aren't real. It'd be like reading your own mind. Most of what he has to say is repeats of what he heard him say before in a previous playthrough, so I'm going to say goodbye for now. But we've opened up um, the first, I believe they're called Fathoms, inside of the Calm. As we progress, and we meet more and more of our previous um, encounters, it will open up more portals and new areas Ready. to explore. Incidentally, this is also often where we go when we die. We retreat into ourselves, and then somehow are able to I'm walk going. out of our own mind's construct out into the world. Highly metaphysical, it makes me sort of question the reality of this place. The cast-offs are imbued by the changing god of the special powers. It makes one wonder if this is some sort of pocket dimension. It must be real, one wonders, Go. if it is real on some level, since it is able to exchange back and forth with the world. Not only in I'm our gone. own corporeal form, but also others have been able to visit it. And not only uh, memories, like the ghostly women, as we will soon see. Enough rest, dear. Rise. Yeah, fat lot of help you were, Callous Stage. Doesn't look like she has much to say about what just happened. But we have our marching orders. We need to find women around the city. Um, she described one as having a duty. I wonder. Um. Don't mind. Duty. There are military around the city, levies around it, but they those appear to be genderless. Right. However, there is uh, some. There are officials around the city who are responsible for managing um, the levies. We could talk to them. Let's also see. Let's just explore. I think a little bit just for the heck of it around the city. Head up north here. What the hell? There's another fountain up here, with another Numenera inside it. Let's just take a look at it. These three triangles float serenely above a scuffed stone basin. You can't help but noticing that the citizens of Sagus are giving this monument a wide berth. The largest triangle shines brightly, radiating a soothing warmth. The middle, darker one hovers above it, turned slightly away from the first with what strikes you as disdain. 
The third is small, dryly amused, and so deeply indigo as to be nearly black. Indigo, incidentally, is the same color as one of the tides. It is removed from the first two triangles. You hesitate. You were sensing emotions from these objects. Intent. Something strange here. Let's examine the smallest triangle. Notice we chose the option that doesn't involve actually reaching out and touching one of the triangles. Not yet. The tiny object spins slightly faster than the others. The more you stare at it, the more you sense a growing presence in the air. The icy regard of distant eyes. The blink, you blink, swaying, and a half second before you open your eyes, you hear the thunderous crack of wood on wood and the rumble of distant voices. You snatch your hand from the triangle. Let's, let's study the medium-sized one. Staring at this triangle is disoriented. The longer you stare at it, the more you feel a tight coiling sensation in your own head. Standing on your toes and stretching, you manage to brush the triangle's icy face with your finger. The air thickens like a weight over you, and you struggle to keep your eyes open. Between the thumping of your heartbeat, you hear thousands of purposeful, rhythmic footsteps treading endless stairs towards the peak of a vast, echoing room. Ah, the days before health and safety. <laughs> the citizens, of course, know to avoid something like this, but there's nothing stopping us from walking up and touching it, potentially harming ourselves considerably. There's barely even a railing around it. Interestingly, the small triangle appears to be apart from the others. I believe that's the one that expressed disdain. I think equally towards us as well as its companions. Let's take a look at the stone basin. The stone is cracked in places, but far newer than the ancient shapes that float above. You suspect that the citizens of Sagus added the basin to make the triangles look less out of place. And of course, it would be somewhat difficult to move them since you seem to experience some sort of vision every time you reach out to touch them. Finally, let's touch the large triangle. You reach out and time slows. Your hand drifts past individual motes of light dappled dust, moving into the warm glow of the large triangle. Calm warmth bleeds up your arm when you grasp the edge of the triangle. It's somehow rigid and flexible at the same time. You blink and... A strip of light unwinds ahead of you like a path through the infinite murmuring dark. Behind you is an ever-shifting zoetrope of linked, motionless yews. It is your past, you realize. Every second of it. Every choice pouring out of you and trailing away into the black. You open your eyes. You're back at the stone ring, still touching the triangle. All three of them are watching you. You blink again. The strip of light, the surrounding darkness, and the valley between the slow pulsing of your heart, you hear the murmurs of countless witnesses, the raised voices of your past and future companions, the heated condemnation of enemies you haven't met yet, and above it all, a trio of voices, one warm, one cold, and one dryly practical. They are speaking of verdict, but you can't hear them over the din. Once again, this reminds me of a scene in Planescape Torment, towards the end where you met three previous versions of yourselves, including one known as the Practical Incarnation. Hmm. We can shut out the visions and leave, but that would end our experience. You can ignore the voices and just keep walking down, but let's shout for silence so we can hear what they have to say about us. You bellow into the dark, clenching your fists, and the crowd instantly falls silent. So do the judges. In the echoing silence that follows, you realize that you are not alone. You always were. You realize that you are alone. You always were. You stride on. The path unravels before your every step. Your past unspools behind you. Stay on the path to see where it leads. You follow the road. Casually, you look to the right, and the path at your feet flickers, as if anticipating your new direction. Clearly, your choice is to find this road's course, and not the other way around. You open your eyes, and the three triangles hang in the air exactly as they did before, unmoving and silent. The vision is gone. And yet you can feel the choices you've made, curving away behind you like a string of jewels. You straighten, moving into the future breath by breath. You suddenly notice a message carved into the stone ring beneath the triangles. Judge yourself. I did notice that we met three judges in there, one practical, dryly, another warm, another cold. If I had to guess from the abstraction, uh, the practical one would probably be the one apart from the others, passing judgment on them, if I had to guess. 
Perhaps I'd rather be warm than cold. The medium one. I'm trying to find out which one is warm and which one is cold. So let's study the medium triangle again. Spin. Smallest triangle. Well, we can only touch the large triangle, so let's touch it again. And step away. Judge yourself. Ready. Interesting. I wonder if there's more enlightenment to be gathered from this, but this seems to be all for now. Let's talk to uh, Aiden Sidibo over here. He seems to be practicing his jutsus. The large, muscled man is practicing some form of martial art as you look on. He's wearing an old, white, rough woven coat with the sleeves torn off and a red bandana is wrapped tightly around his head. He seems to be moving much faster than his size suggests is possible. He glides between stances as swiftly as water. His fists are blurring hammers, striking at invisible enemies. His bare, calloused feet snap and slash at the air like knives. You're very fast. Yes, Aiden says. The Drebbel's gift. His hand slips around an invisible assailant's arm. He snaps it with a stab of his elbow, then crushes his enemy's throat and flips him over his shoulder to the ground. Jacanthum Murray, he shouts, spinning over the invisible adversary's corpse to deliver a triangle of jabs to the chest of his next attacker. The entire set of moves took no longer than four seconds. He catches you staring and smiles. You must be wondering why I'm shouting. Yes. I'm not surprised. I must look like a lunatic, he says, before spearing his opponent's jugular with three fingers. Canthid thrust. It helps me focus on my breathing, my strength, and my will. It reminds me of how weak I once was, and how strong I've become. Years ago, I was a starving beggar. I managed to steal a wedge of pie crust and was terrified that someone else would take it from me. So I hid inside that metal structure over there to enjoy my feast. Bite of the hidden queb, he says, clawing his enemy's eyes. The stale crust crumbled into pieces between my eager fingers, and something strange happened. They drifted towards the ground like the softest of snowflakes. I was able to pluck each of them from the air before they fell. At first I was delighted, and I wept. How far had I fallen that clean food was a miracle, he sighs, and delivers four more blows to the air's belly. But the miracle never ended. The longer I lived in that shelter, the more I could slow the world by concentrating. I swore to never waste this gift. I would honor it by becoming stronger faster. I would challenge the predators of the world and take their killing blows from them. I would never be prey again. Grush stomp. <laughs> I bet I'm faster than you. You're not the first to think so, he says casually, snapping an assailant's neck. I should warn you that all the others are dead. That's not a threat. I only fight to the death. He flings the invisible corpse aside. Before I accept your challenge, I need to see if you're good enough to face me. His fist lashes toward you. Julius Kisk. A slow punch first, he thinks. Some challengers are braggarts, but they don't deserve death. This guy's quite serious. If we fail, he will kill us. So let's try and block the punch and strike back. And I'm going to spend a lot of points here, since if we don't... You bat, aside his, fist, you bat his fist aside and aim yours at his nose. He lowers his head, dashing your knuckles off his forehead. I underestimated you, he says, an odd light in his eyes. That won't happen again. Tell me when you're ready for the next round. As it happens, we're not very fast. <laughs> we're much more of a brain box than anything else. And that initial uh, passing of the test has cost us. Um, if we failed us, though, there would have been no going back. We do have this Fleetfoot Moss that we picked up before, however, and that's going to restore some of our speed. And now I think it's as good a time as any to use it. Going to target ourselves. Here. Now. So we're back to full speed. Save my game once again. And we're going to talk to Aiden. Why do you insist on fighting to the death? I fight to learn my opponent's most powerful techniques, he says calmly. How can I be certain they'll use them unless death is on the line? I'm ready for the next part of your test. So am I, he says, nodding gravely. But prepare yourself. I will not hold back this time. Dabiri's assault. He launches a two-handed blow at your face. Faster now, he thinks, but not deadly. Parry and counterattack. He won't see it coming. 
70% is the most we can do. I wonder if we have anything we can equip to make us faster, but I don't think we've acquired anything like that yet that can do it. Let's try. Oh, and we succeed again. You lunge into the attack, driving your arms up between his fists and pushing them apart. One hand whips around the back of his neck and pulls him into range of your forehead. Crack. He stumbles back, blinking, smiling. You're ready. I'll check my inventory again, just to be sure. Let's see. No, no. It's a light weapon, but it doesn't... I'm not looking exactly for something to restore speed. I think three will be enough, since we can't spend more than that anyways. But I wonder if Tiber's carrying anything that might be useful. No. No, nothing yet. And I don't think evasion or anything else like that will help us. So, let's give it a shot here. You've returned, he says, his eyes locked on the invisible enemy before him. Well, have I passed all your tests? You have, he says, but I will remind you one more time. This will be a fight to the death. He draws one foot back, settling his weight on it. His hands come up and draw apart, tightening into fists. Are you certain you want to do this? A short fight, one kick at full speed is deadly enough, he says. It's a pity our ability to read his mind and what we're doing doesn't help us actually dodge his blows at all. I'll tell him we're ready. Very well. The challenge has begun. He regards you with, ser with the serene eyes of a predator, chest rising and falling. A warm wind tumbles across the stones between you. He flows with it, spinning away from the ground. His foot slices towards your head in a blur. Time slows, as if the universe is holding its breath. Cossetan kick. And we can say either fists of the last cast-off, or hammer of the changing gods. I'm going to try hammer of the changing gods. It's smashing... <sighs> Did we take anything that makes us difficult for us to smash? I don't think so. And we have a larger might pool to spend. So let's try Hammer of the Changing God. Eesh. It's speed, and it's only a 60% base difficulty. 0%, so I think, since we don't have quick fingers, regardless, it would have been 60%. Oh, thank goodness. We succeeded. Before his foot can connect, you drive your fist upwards, smashing him beneath the chin. He tumbles gracelessly to the ground, choking. Time resumes, flowing through you, and you feel some of Iden's inhuman speed melding with your own reflexes. You have won, Iden says, when he regains some of his breath. Finish it. So we've gained a speed pool from that. So we can either straight up kill him, we can have him live with the knowledge that I beat you, much like our progenitor did with the Tabat, or we can say, and rob the world of your talent. Never. So each one of these options lines up very carefully with uh, some of the tides. So I almost certainly, no matter what we pick, will align us in some way. I don't feel particularly vindictive, and I don't feel like killing him. So the only one that seems even remotely moral would be option number one. And rob this world of your talent? Never. I see, he says, lowering his head, troubled. Perhaps I should have shown my other opponents the same mercy, and said that their talent is lost forever. He staggers back up to his feet and resumes training. Kellistage says, Dearest, the man did try to kill you. The least you could do is return the favor. I do thank you for not robbing the world of his talent. The square is a better place for the sight of him, jumping about and flexing. Nice. So, we need to get back on track for finding those, uh, this world, then. the women's consciousness that's being forced into the bodies of women around town. Let's explore some more. Yes, child. I don't think she mentioned the exact number, but they can be found all over. Of course. I see someone playing the flute over here. Let's go talk to Athena. As you regard this girl, you are struck by a spark of recognition. But they hardly look the same, something about her reminds you of the ghost you encountered in the fifth eye. The girl stands outside of a crumbling old house, playing the flute. She wears a simple dress, and her golden hair falls past her shoulders. The melody she plays is gentle and soft, but it somehow carries to every corner of the street. As you approach, she stops playing and smiles up at you with large green eyes. Shins for a song, sir. How much? It's eight shins for a sad song, or twelve for a happy one. Why are sad songs cheaper than happy songs? Because there are more of them, sir. 
Well, it is torment, <laughs> after all. So, should we have a sad song to sort of set the mood or choose something appropriate to the title of the game? Or should, because there's so much grimdark around us, try and uh, create a different melody? I think the way that I tend to like to play um, would be to pay a little bit more for a happy song. Thank you, sir. This one should give you a lift. Never felt better than I do right now. <laughs> so we've gained a positive fetter called a Venus Diddy, but it will only last until we rest. Do you want me to play another? Uh, no, but can I ask you some questions? All right. You remind me of someone I met in the Fifth Eye. Her eyes narrow suspiciously. People say that to me sometimes. They think I'm one of those girls who are becoming somebody else. But I'm not, at least not anymore. Not anymore, what do you mean? Making a note. When I was younger, I used to feel like there was another person who was always nearby, just out of sight. Sometimes she'd even slip into my mind and I'd hear her voice. She glances away. I think I was supposed to become her. Her smile flashes then, and she looks back at you. But I wouldn't. Every night, in my dreams, we fought. And every night, I won. And after a while, she got weaker and weaker, until I couldn't hear her voice at all. Now she's gone, and I've never heard from her again. This child has remarkable strength of character. She managed to fight her off, completely. Do you know anything more about her? No, and I don't want to. I don't think we had much in common. Maybe that's why I could fight her off, and the other girls can't. She shivers. I'm just glad she's gone. Are you sure you don't know anything more about her? No, nothing. So, we've met one of the four. And I think we will have reason to return right. to speak to her later and talk to the other children. Let's look at these trash piles. Ah. Judging by the tile shingles and bricks that are piled here, these are the remains of collapsed buildings carefully pushed out of sight. So, as you can see here, these buildings built on the, on the cliffside are slowly falling apart and crashing down into the cliffs below. Strange place to want to live. These children are probably squatters. I don't think anybody else would want to live here. Something over here stashed. Far below, you can see the ledge jutting out from the cliff face. A collapsed tunnel appears to have once been used to access the strange objects cradled in the corner. And there is something to loot there, which means that there is a way to get over there. There's a pile right in front of us, though, that's a little bit easier to access. And some shields. Outstanding. Okay. Sure enough. So, let's head back. We can go down here to the underbelly if we wish. But, uh, let's head back over yes. here. Now. There's a tormented levy over here. In an instant. And there's another woman. Someone called Loss of Self. This young woman clutches herself and growls low and continuously under her breath. Pearly white light shimmers from a vial on her wrist, and her eyes are red rim as if she's been crying. You've never seen her before, and yet. Your hands are sweating and your breath catches in your inherited chest. Shame burns your throat, hot and sour. Your body recognizes her, even if you do not. She thinks to herself, this isn't you, only I am real. You don't need to fight me. Leave me alone, she mutters, and it's a moment before you realize she's not talking to you. You took my face, stole my family, whisper at me in my own voice, isn't that enough? Isn't that... She breaks off when she hears you. She's in my head and she won't shut up. Talk loud. Talk over her so I can hear you. We felt shame. And um, a lot of this reminds us, of course, of Dianara from Planescape. Um, similarly, a woman that we loved, um, who was reduced to a specter that we encountered early uh, in Planescape. And the effects of that rippled throughout the entire game. The angry sneer of her lips suddenly brings the image of the ghost from the fifth eye to your mind. What is that shining object you're holding? She flinches but reveals 
The vial strapped to her wrist, it glows with an inner light, and the tiny ripples within seem to be casting moving shadows on her palm. I woke up one night in a building I've never seen before, she says, soft and low. I found this beneath a pile of blackened scales. If you shake it, it makes a picture. Watch. She juggles the vial and holds up her other hand. Indistinct shadows mimic the motion on her palm. Why are you holding on to it? Because I feel like it was mine, she blurts, then grimaces. As if the words escaped without her permission. At any rate, it's mine now, and I don't need any more of a reason than that. Woman thinks to herself, it's mine. I don't need any more of a reason than that. <laughs> Interesting. It's a dangerous weapon. You should give it to me. Which would be a lie, and I wonder if this thing that she's clinging to keeps her anchored. The last time we scanned her thoughts, though, it was the... Uh, woman who fought back, and the thing that she's holding on to belonged to her. So I wonder if this does, we can't tell at the moment whether or not this vial belongs to her or to the apparition, and that will inform the morality of our choice. So let's ask about something else. You hear a woman in your head. Yes, she says, biting the words like an enemy's throat. Now stop talking about her. It brings her forward, and she clings. She whines, and she won't stop, so please stop talking about her. Her thoughts say, I am not some woman. I am you. Please let me in. So we could press the issue and perhaps force a sort of takeover, but in the process, this woman would lose herself and perhaps never recover. One wonders what the distinction between that and murder might be, so instead we'll exhaust our other talking opportunity to remind me of someone. Making a note. What? No, no, you're crazy. But the sudden widening of her eyes suggests that you've hit on something. She turns away. Stop talking about her. It makes her louder. I am not her. So we've gotten confirmation that when we scan her thoughts, it's the other woman talking, and that the other woman did confirm that the vial that she's holding belonged to her. So... I think it probably is dangerous. It may be related to her coming back. Then again, it might not. So this is dubious, what we're about to do. But we're going to use deception and say, it's a dangerous weapon. You should give it to me. We're going to use our Lyomancer here. Really, we have to spend that much to get it away. Well, let's go ahead. Her fingers tighten over the vial, then loosen. All right, she says, looking desperately unhappy. Still, she seems somewhat relieved when she hands it over. So, I think we did the right thing. It's a shield. It grants us 15 evasion, and the next enemy that makes a melee attack against us falls down. Interesting. And I think it actually paid for itself, just purely economically speaking. Um, the cost of spending three intellect can probably be offset by the purchase of a consumable that will restore it. This vial of viscous fluid belonged to loss of self until you persuaded her to give it to you. Someone has added the straps to the device so it can be attached to her an arm. The fluid is a single protective consciousness in a liquid form, though you cannot know how and what form it may have been before. The glass-like material of the vial can turn porous when needed, allowing the fluid to flow out. It will try and protect you from incoming attacks, forming a bright silvery shield that flings incoming forces back towards their source. I wonder if possessing this object and going through the quest as we did before, if we had been playing a female cast-off, might have changed the way that this played out. Let's say farewell for now. What is something that we can actually equip? There are better, uh... Oh, but it removes our... Really? So it's light, but it has to be wielded two-handed? No. Okay, good. Good, we can equip them both. Coming. I think that a default shield is actually just like a junk one. No, it's only 10% evasion? Hmm. I thought it was 15 and some change, so this is actually better. And would be better for any of our other characters who can use an off-handed weapon. Right. So, there's another person that we can talk to about this. There are four women that we have to speak to about this. And three of them are in Cliff's Edge. There is a demonstration going here. All right. The responsibility is ours, yours, and mine. And we must all stand together against these monsters. I think, so, this starts another quest, and it's an interesting one, but it's one yes. that I think I want to get now. involved with. I saw Stitches this morning, right here in Cliffsets. The gist of what is happening here is that 
homes are falling into the sea, and people are blaming a species called the Stitches for that. Outsiders. So uh, I don't know actually if they're what's called visitants, um, aliens from other dimensions, um, or whether or not they're just simply non-human. I suspect there were once visitants at some time. There's a fellow here who's glowing. Now, our, our goal um, is to get our party up to four people just for the time being, and then to make that party of four the party of four that we want, which includes the cold, calculating Jack that we've been told about before. For now, though, um, there's an individual here, a Ritus, that we can talk to. The first thing you notice about this wiry young man is the golden haze, the glow surrounding him. It sparkles in his eyes and gives his easy grin a warmth that you can feel right down to your gut. He spots you and straighten. I know what you're thinking. How in the world did you survive that crash, Eratus? The answer is, as it always is, backflips. But hold on. How did you know my name? Never mind. Not important. Of course you know my name. I'm Eratus. He plants his hands on his skinny hips and beams. And his thoughts are in all caps. This adventure is going nowhere. We're standing still. It is beginning. When? Your thoughts are strange. Thoughts? Eridus' eyes widen in alarm. I try to avoid those. They have agendas, you know. Thinking, planning, plotting. He shakes his head. No, no, heroic instinct, that's always best. He hears us. Impossible. I can hear your surface thoughts. Why are they so different from what you're saying? If I have thoughts, sir, then that's news to me. Are you sure he can't hear us? We are certain. How did you end up crashing the airship? I'm glad you asked. This is somewhat of an understatement. He looks ecstatic. I was climbing up the cliffs to the caravan, Sarai, to see how impossible it was when I saw a star falling towards the reef. He raises an earnest finger. I knew right then that finding this star was my destiny. He runs his hands through his curls. But what was I going to do? Climb down? Boring. I already did it the other way. Walk? Walk. Worse. Far worse. No fun at all. Tell him about the black flips. No one cares about the black flips. Tell them. He grins. I saw the airship docked over my head. I raced on up, borrowed the ship, and pointed it right at the reef. His face falls. I don't know what happened next. Despite my expert piloting, the airship steered itself directly at the cliffs. I had no choice. I landed as fast and as hard and as safely as possible. Shaking his head, he sighs. I never did find that falling star. At this point, somebody else had found it, and it's their destiny now. Should we tell him? He would get very excited. You're in luck. The falling star was me. No, Everitus shouts, overjoyed. Yes, really? It really was you. He grabs you by both shoulders. This is fate. You were meant to travel with me. You have to. Don't say no. They will lead us to glory. They will lead us to pain. Join them. Join them. So, it's here. I'm not sure. So they're, they're quite schizophrenic and they're in conflict with each other, but they are in unity about joining us. And I wonder, I wonder if there's something that seems to have possessed him at some point that's also responsible for the glow and his strange outward behavior, and that he's in sort of an internal battle in the same way that we were with the Ashen's Imitations quest. It's very reminiscent of what's happening here. However, there's another possibility. Um, he is, is as heroic as he believes himself to be, and so perhaps this internal conflict is himself battling with his own thoughts so that he can control his thoughts and make himself uh, more powerful and more heroic than he otherwise would be by controlling him. Why should I let you join me? He gives you a puzzled look, as if you just wondered aloud why air is important. I'm an adventurer, he repeats, brow furrowed. I thought I told you. Adventure happens when I'm around, and you'll get to be a part of it. He raises a finger. But you'll have to keep up where we go. He stares at the invisible horizon. We go swiftly, strongly, and most of all, handsomely. He leans in conspiratorially. Until you get handsome, I'll cover for the both of us. Yes, I want you to join me. <laughs> he doesn't seem like a liability at all. Of course you do, and I'm ready. I'm always ready. Are we heading into a fight, or should I start one? <laughs> Jesus Christ. So we've got ourselves a thief who's stolen state secrets from Sagos and is just waiting for the other, st other shoe to drop with enemies. We've got a woman 
whose only interest in us appears to be in our relationship with the train gene gun as much as she can learn. Psychotic, really. She wanted us to kill that guy before. And now we've got somebody whose trouble seems to follow him wherever he goes and has made a philosophy out of never thinking about anything twice. What could possibly go wrong? Let's examine the ship here. Airships are known to be nearly uncrashable due to their leisurely cruising speeds and simplified controls. This crash must have taken a rather unique confluence of events to occur. This hatch appears to be the only visible means to enter the building, but it's firmly sealed. I don't think we'll actually ever get the chance to open it. It just sort of explains where the people on Sega's Cliffs actually keep their belongings. But the reason I did this is that we're now up to a nice, safe number of party members. And we can check him out. He is a glaive, an overly impulsive glaive, who is as heroic as he believes himself to be. They're the warriors. In fact, uh, we can read the description. Glaives are the elite warriors of the Ninth World, using weapons and armor to fight their enemies. Scouts, guardians, warlords, and soldiers could be glaives. Most glaives either have a high might, etc., etc., etc. So they're warriors and fighters. Um, and he wields a heavy melee weapon. Let's take a look. I'm, I'm curious as to what his skills are. Probably with just general melee weapons. So we can actually equip him with anything with the way that he's built right now, and he'll be good with it. He also has skills in things that he is, um, that we are not good at, things like smashing, which unfortunately isn't very useful. As the penetrative skills go, I mean, this probably can and will open up a few key things down the line, but it's nowhere near as useful as, say, the ability to talk our way through or quick fingers to sort of pick locks and that kind of thing. So he would be a sort of ideal fourth companion, just sort of statistically, as he shores up all of our weaknesses, but so far, at least, I haven't found his character very interesting. I found what uh, Matt Kina has to say a lot more so. And Calistage is just so darn useful, so the choice is just really between Tiber and um, Eridus. And in those situations, I tend to choose Tiber because he's suave and so forth. So we end up with an unbalanced party later on with uh, two nanos and two uh, jacks rather than uh, two nanos, a jack, and a glaive. And that's all right, except really in combat. We're just going to have to be better in combat. We'll take a rightist with us for now. Let's head up here. Take a look. We can actually interact with this rubble over here. A fallen pile of wooden stone marks the place where a house once stood. Let's talk to these three. They're members of the cult of the changing god, as we can tell from their robes. Itasi. Surprise briefly registers on the cultist's face when she sees your tattoo, then she inclines her head respectfully. Beloved vessel, I don't believe we've met before. Do Kazmin and Mimian know you're visiting us? Who are Kazmin and Mimian? They represent those of us who honor the changing god. She inclines her head to you again. Your eternal father. They can be found in Circus Minor. You seem less deferential than some of the other cultists. Why? Not all of us revere your father, she says carefully. We simply honor him for his boundless wisdom and bottomless knowledge. We wish to emulate him. But worship him? No. Good day to you. I wonder if these others have anything to add. No. Hmm. I wonder if we don't have to start another quest. So one of the people that we need to visit is in here. And, uh, in order to speak with her, yeah, they're not, uh, ordinarily talking to them would give us the cue to take a look in here, but uh, we're not getting the prompt for that. I think Piquo may be only interested in up here, but let's, let's talk to Piquo. The mutant boy gazes at the entrance to the surgical parlor, flinching at each scratch of razor metal on metal from within. By your estimation, he is in his late teens, but is the size of a young, malnourished child. 
His arms are little more than bone wrapped in red speckled skin, and raw line zigzags down between his mishmash eyes and over his blade of a nose, as if pointing directly at his thin lips. He sees you looking, and bird-like muscles flex in his frail jaw. Get a good look, he says, lifting his chin. Or maybe you want to call me some names. I hear eggshell a lot, or maybe lightning bolt. I get that one from time to time. He crosses his bony arms and glares at you. Don't let me stop you. Call me some names. Laugh. Do it now, because in another few minutes, I'll be the one laughing. I'm not laughing, and I'm sorry if I offended you. I don't want your apologies. I... You didn't offend me. Believe me, I'm used to this by now. I'm not going to be the butt of everyone's jokes anymore, he says. Electricity sizzles within the nearby parlor. This time he does not flitch away. Lightning flickers trapped in his determined eyes. I have some money, all right. I'm going to use it to change myself, change everything I can. He trails off, studying you in turn. His eyes widen as he glances quickly away, studying the nearby parlor instead. What sort of changes are you considering? And he thinks to himself, is he the guy who could be, could be a sign? What do you care, he says. I'm sure you have business somewhere in the city. I don't want to be any trouble. Why did you look at me strangely earlier? His mouth trembles as though he's wrestling with a question he doesn't want to ask. Does it feel good to be stared at, does it? He says at last, looking back at the parlor. He seems to be deflecting your question, though it isn't clear why. He's forgotten me. It doesn't matter. His words to me then mean the same to me now. I can ask him one more time. But he's not going to tell us. Can everyone buy improvements from the parlor? Yeah, you pay the keeper, and the drones remake the, your body the way you want. Farewell. Okay. So, we are going to come back here in a bit. We can check out the parlor, of course, to see what sort of awesome improvements, but we're going to need to get, make some more money, I think, before we can really uh, take advantage of what he has to offer. Let's take a look. It's going to take us back to Circus Minor, and that is one of the places we need to go. Naturally. So, let's head this way. I think what we're going to do is we're going to start a secondary quest called the Sorrow's Prey, and that's going to let us take a look at that building and complete the Ashen Imitations quest that we're currently on. Without doubt. Most of the quests in this early part of the game are intertwined. I'm trying to take them one at a time to try and keep things from getting too confusing between sessions. Um, but, unfortunately, a lot of the time you're forced to sort of complete things in batch, if you like. Gladly. As you can see here, there's a sculptor, and all this art has been custom done. I love this right here. I mean, it's it's one of the nice things about a lot of the pre-rendered... Um, you know, normally in a low-budget game, or a uh, less than triple-A budget, let's call it, game, um, often will lack a lot of um, unique graphical features because it's just so darn expensive to up the graphics. And they've opted for something that's... Um, you know, it's not it's not cutting edge, but it makes for some great, you know, still pre-rendered art. I mean, all of this has been sort of custom done. It doesn't come from sort of you know, Hello, default package. Hello, calisthenics. Don't shout. When you do, we can all hear you. It makes you even more irritating than normal. I understand calisthenics. <laughs> These two are fun to have a party together. <laughs> But anyways, um, you know, you won't find some stock stuff from the Unity store um, as much in this game, which is nice. They managed to pull that off, even though uh, they didn't have a big team or a lot of money to work with. Let's take a look. In several of the peaches, the creature depicted appears to almost lunge out of the stone, almost as if hurtling itself at the sculptor. Perhaps that's why they were left unfinished. Myriad statues sit at various stages of completion, each featuring a figure that leaves you with a feeling of profound disquiet when you look at it. Let's talk to the sculptor, Zalfi. This portly man's cracked and bleeding hands are always moving, picking fretfully at his thick lips, running through his thinning hair, or moaning aimless shapes in the air. His clothes are marked with paint, dust, dried blood, and clay. His eyes brim with frustrated tears as he studies the strangely familiar sculpture arrayed about him. 
A soul like slivers of ice, he mutters, fingertips long, shriveled, sharp, screams, trapped in flesh. She holds him in place. She's killing him. He's not looking at her. Why? Why isn't he? Afraid? No. He claws absently at his sparse beard. What am I not seeing? What am I missing? His thoughts say, Who was he? What was he feeling? Without that, I can do nothing. What's wrong? we ask. Everything, he says without a moment's pause, effortlessly drawing you into his self-directed tirade. Everything else is almost right, which means everything is wrong. I am Zalfi, stone carver, sculptor, divine painter of living eyes, and in this challenge my greatest work, my talent, has finally abandoned me. He sweeps a scornful hand at the sculptures. Behold my art, wanderer. Witness these dull stumps, these crude replicas of a sublime being. What is it you think I've made? Let's try and recall why the sculptures look so familiar. So, this creature lunging out at us has to do with the sorrow, so ordinarily in this sort of circumstance we know that we can proceed with the quest without it, um, but any information I feel like we can gather about the sorrow would be incredibly uh, useful to our survival at this point, so I'm going to spend as many points as I can. Critical success, we get our points back. You stare at the sculptures. Your memories flow into its sweeping curves, teasing you with what you've seen in your short life and beyond. Yes, this towering thing, the true form of the creature that pursues you. Zalfi has sculpted the sorrow. You don't realize that you've spoken aloud until you hear Zalfi gasp and you see the tears in his eyes. Yes, sorrow, or even grief, is present in the work. I feel it. But where? I cannot pull it from the stone. I saw this creature on a cold night, not long ago. Smoking coronas of blackened light drew me to my window, Zalfi says, shaping the scene with his palms. And there, on the street below, was she, gripping a man in her talons. Before my very eyes, she ripped his essence from him, leaving him a steaming husk. He drops his hands. But what do you care? You don't grasp the importance of capturing such a subject. Of course I do. She's mysterious and fascinating. She, Safi stares at you, dumbfounded. You think I'm trying to sculpt the killer, he says, and then immediately corrects himself. Of course I am. I've succeeded, in fact. She is beauty and vengeance and carbon. What artist wouldn't worth his metal couldn't capture such a being? But she doesn't need to be remembered. How could anyone forget such a lethal creature? No, the source of my ruin is this damnable man. Zalfi points a trembling finger at the faceless human cradled in the statue's talons, a charred, oddly familiar pattern etched on the stone head. He, sh he, sh he stared eternity in the face and did not blink, but he will be forgotten unless I capture him here, and I cannot do that unless I know what drove him. Zalfi swallows. The moment he fell, I ran for the street, but the Dendro Uhur claimed his body and took it away, probably to their foul chapel in the underbelly. Now I'll never know who he was. See how just, how just how obsessive this man is. How many statues of this being have you made, we ask? Ha! If only my efforts could be limited so. I've sculpted that blasted moment in marble, granite, and clay. I've painted it in oil and blood. It even follows me into sleep, where I weave the scene from clouds and dream stuff. A frustrated tear rolls down his cheek. Even those were flawed. Artists, type of murmurs. You'd think they'd be a happy bunch. They slap paint on canvas and someone pays them for it. But no, they thrash about in their sleep, moaning and sealing all the sheets. You turn your attention back to Zalfi. So anything else you can remember about the creature that killed your subject? What a surprise, Zalfi says with a ragged, scornful, uh, scornful sigh. Yes, let us ignore the incandescent flare of the stranger's brief life and focus on his murderer. She's so much more glamorous. He, grip, his, he grips his sparse hair as if it's going to fall out and glares at you. That's what you want, isn't it? That's what everyone wants. He thinks, like so many, he wants flash and flourish, but humanity is what truly inspires. Hmm. No, I want to see this moment fully, to understand why it inspires you so much. Oh, of course, Zafi says, a fluttered blush rising on his cheeks as he directs your attention to his work. I captured her as I saw her. Perfectly. See the dexterous, overlong fingers, the flesh formed of shrieking prey. But there was more to that moment that even I could capture here. 
In studying her form from my window, I knew that she did not belong in our world, and yet I could not help but see her, see her there, as though she was forcing me to accept her presence. Zalfi licks his lips. To look upon her is to see death made flesh. And yet, her victim saw her and did not flee. Why? What granted him such bravery that we lesser creatures cower at the coming of the night? If I learn anything about your subject, I will let you know. I'll remember that. Let's check our journal. Zalfi, a sculptor in Circus Minor, witnessed the murder of a man by the sorrow, the same creature that is hunting me. Now he is obsessed with sculpting the moment of the killing, but all his attempts have been failures. He cannot immortalize the victim until he learns more about him. So, we know to talk to the Dendra O'Hur in their chapel, and we know that the chapel, from our previous quest, is in the underbelly. So, that is where we need to head next. Let's check the time here. I'm going for an hour and 20 minutes, so I think we can go for at least another 40. Let's see. The underbelly, the underbelly. may have to go through Government Square first to get to it. That's Cliff's Edge. I'm going to explore the, uh, the northeast of this part of... Uh, Circus Minor. Ah, yes, here we go. This will take us to the underbelly. And here we are. Examine the beds here. Tiny dwellings are carved into the rock wall, furnished with reeking bedrolls and bug-infested rags. Alagurn is here, so if we wanted to pick him up and uh, replace Callistage with him, we could now. There's a headless man wandering around, I've, I've got to know. But, <laughs> expectedly, he has nothing to say. I think there's a... Uh, a moment worth sharing here. Let's speak to, uh, Crooked Keek. A small, hollow-cheeked mutant sings a soft, wavering tune to herself. Yellow bruises discolor her skin, wounds formed not from violence, but from malnutrition, and her prominent bones bend and twist at odd angles. Still, she smiles. She smiles at the oily water, devoid of any fish. She smiles as she arranges her empty basket beside her. And she smiles at you when she sees you standing over her. Hello. I'm Crooked Creek of the Cold Canyon Tribe. I haven't seen you down here before. I hope you're not here to fish. They're nibbling today instead of biting. She coughs into her cupped hands. <coughs> a raw and ragged hacking that bends her double. You take her for a child at first, but after studying her features, it's clear that she is in her late teens. It's only some mutation, and her bony stature born of starvation that makes her seem childlike. You said you're part of the Cold Canyon tribe. Are they down here too? No, she says lightly. They're all gone. Either dead or gone. She still isn't meeting your eyes. There used to be a lot of us. We came here when I was a baby, running from, she pauses, thinking, a war. Some sort of war that never ends. My parents thought we would be safe here, but the tribe died off, one by one. She's referring to that endless conflict between the first cast-off and the changing god. How was the city hard in your tribe? They were used to living in the wilderness, so they knew what they could eat safely. Here, it's not so simple. My mother told me that ten people died eating tainted food before we found this fishing hole. She stares into the murky water. And there's the diseases you can catch in the city, and the hate. A lot of us were killed, just for being hard to look at, I guess. Is it as hard for you to survive here as it was for your people? No, she says, smiling. I don't have a lot to eat, but I'm more resistant to sickness than my parents were. And people here know me. They leave me alone. You said everyone in your tribe is dead? Not everyone, she says, with a brave little smile. I'm here, and some of us left for better places. I bet they're doing really well. Your real name is Crooked Keek? Sort of. My parents called me Keek, 
but my but but the nickname came later. She hunches over, her eyes darting shadily from side to side. It's because I sell junk for high prices and bribe the levies to carry people off in the night. She laughs. No, not really. People call me crooked because I look twisted and broken. Her thoughts say, I wish they wouldn't, but it's okay. I am crooked, right? So she is carries a world of suffering on her shoulder. Her whole people is gone, not only to her own isolation here, and she's left behind, yet she portrays a sort of outward smile and friendliness. She has no reason to. She still hasn't offered to sell us anything, you know. And um, But internally, just on the edges of her thoughts, she has a lot of reason to be quite sad. Don't you mind that people call you crooked? Not really. I can't call them liars, can I? She smiles. But it's not the Gideon thing you saw before. Why do you think the fish aren't biting? The fish down there are pretty fast and smart. They're nibbling at the bait, then swimming away. She watches the line with a combination of hunger and weariness. It's hard for me to get to the pole in time when the rod twitches, and harder to reel in the catch. I'm not very strong. It's a shame, because we did select as one of our abilities a healing ability, but we can't use it on her. It's not enough to heal a mutation, something that's changed her on a genetic level. Can I try fishing with your gear? You're welcome to it, she says. Only if you do find something, could you share? She trails off, blushing. Never mind. Company is better than a scrawny fish. Let's go. Save our game. I don't think I have anything to improve my speed, but I can't imagine myself spending more than two points Let's on go. this anyways. This thin, glowing thread pierces the surface of the water and plunges deep into the black depths, like a white line drawn in shining ink. Let's examine the line. You try flicking the shining string and your finger goes right through it. Could you try catching something for me? I've had no luck today. Besides, everything down there is pretty much stronger than me. Ah, so it's a matter of might. Let's try catching something for Crooked Creek. You pull on the line and something in the dark below pulls back. You press your lips together and reel in your catch. Oh, well, that was easy. A muddy cipher dangles from the end of the line. It's beautiful, Crooked Creek breathes. I was just hoping for fish. I can sell it and eat it for weeks. <laughs> so, we can keep it, or we can hand it over. When I've talked before about the continuum of RPGs between simulation and style, for lack of a better word, one play this is, I think, probably the best demonstration of how um, this game's bent towards simulation differs from, say, Mass Effect's bent towards style. In Mass Effect, um, the act of handing over something like this to Crooked Creek would almost certainly gain you Paragon points as a reward, which in turn would grant you other interactions with the game. Um, in the earlier references, like KOTOR, for example, aligning yourself with the light side would unlock powers, if nothing else. But it was a game that was really the whole series of Bioware games, or games designed to reward particular styles of play. They recognize that a lot of people want to be heroes, and so the universe sort of bends itself around that, constantly rewarding you with characters acting like they might not, and the world acting like it might not be, so that you can act how you want to. There's really no right answer when it comes to this. But in the case here, in uh, Torment, if you hand over um, the cipher that you just uncovered to Crooked Creek, she will presumably sell it. You don't get anything for that. She doesn't spread your name to other people. It doesn't start a quest. You just are down a cipher, and a pretty useful one. I myself, I've never been able to bring myself to keep it, even though I know it is 100% in my interest, and there's basically no penalty in game. There's only reward for keeping it, but she's just, just like, she's a model. We should all be like this, you know? We've all got our problems, but holy shit, you know? Um, we've got to give it to her. You pass the cipher to her, and she squinches her eyes shut in unmitigated joy. Thank you, Thank you. Use my fishing pole whenever you want. We can tug on the line, but, um... I don't think we ever get anything. You might have better luck tomorrow. You know, in fact, maybe I can take it all back and maybe we do get a reward, although I think we can um, use the fishing pole regardless, so it's kind of a wash. And always, you'll always let us come back, I think, of and catch things. Could be wrong about that. If I am wrong, it would undermine the whole point that I made, but, you know, hence the joys of live I streaming. The soul of <laughs> There's a lot of examples of that, though. Let's see. Um, so, 
We're a quest within a quest now, and oh, I don't right. want to start the next leg of it by talking to Mappers. But let's go to the Dendra Ohur Chapel. Is it this way? No, is it back around this way? Depends around to the east, I know that. Yeah, here we are. Let's go. So as we recall, these are the people who eat people for a living, and in so doing, um, gather up their memories. And they were being used before um, with uh, in Tiber's quest. Um, he had to get his friend off, because if his friend was killed and then consumed by the Dendro, or he would have been implemented, uh, implicated as an accomplice. And the Devourer of Wrongs, whom we met there earlier, is now down here. Let's see if he has anything new to say. This enormously fat figure stands alone, motionless. Because of its metal mask and obscuring layers of devices, filters, and hoses it wears, you can't be sure if it's a man or a woman, or even if it's entirely human. Its thick neck bulges and clenches as if it was chewing something. He thinks, this one looks familiar. Some mind in my mind once knew him. You recall this being before, standing behind Reese on the execution platform in Circus Minor. So, this RPG, like many other RPGs has a habit of making the whole universe about you. It's a sort of a pet peeve of mine because it's unrealistic and I like, um, I mean, a lack of realism by itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it, it does sort of tend to keep bringing you out of the experience. When I see something like that, um, other of you may not care. You may be able to sort of willing to launch yourself into the fantasy and enjoy the fact that um, so much, you know, flattery happens. But if you're going to do it, I like the way that Torment does it in this case better than a lot of, say, the Bioware lineup of RPGs where they just kiss your butt a lot and through fate alone and circumstances of your birth, you're just better and special and everything revolves around you. Here, it's actually part of the plot. You are the cast off of somebody who is presumably far superior to you and because of his actions and um, his power and throughout the history of the world, it provides a reasonable um, in-game explanation for why you're so important other than just power, I think. And it has a, a tinge to it that makes it so that it's not always just sort of flattery and it's in your interest. Uh, very often, as we've seen already, it can come back to bite you. So, let's ask him, what is your role in the Dendra Ohur? I attend executions and eat the condemned once they are dead. Their meat shows me the extent of their guilt and gives me their memories, revealing motive, method, accomplishment, accomplices, and secrets. The Dendra Ohur have always performed the service for the city. And no doubt it is because of this essential contribution that people are willing to countenance their presence at all. It's disgusting what they do, and that fact alone might make them get run out of the city. It's a superstitious lot, as we've seen before. Um, but... You can't, nobody else can perform this sort of function, so they're sequestered here in the belly of the underbelly, far away. And, and there they're able to sort of um, survive and make a living. So here again we have an uh, opportunity to align ourselves with one of the tides. Um, and all of these things are not quite, you're immortalizing them. You can be preserving the knowledge of the dead is a worthy ideal, even if it's dead criminals, I suppose. So that's more um, the sort of uh, the alignment that uh, the Order of Truth likes, the preservation of knowledge. Um, the first one, I think, has more to do with the silver um, tide, if I had to guess, um, fame and so forth. Uh, immortalizing them. I like the, the fact that... Um, that they, in so doing, that they don't have to die. It's a shame it's not voluntary. We are. Fragments of their consciousness live on in my mind. When I die, I will be eaten by my successor. And so those fragments will pass from one generation to the next. Their sorrows and mistakes, never to be lost or forgotten. Farewell. A plump middle-aged woman lies upon the slab. Her edge has, her head has been stripped of flesh. Her eyes placed neatly on the slab beside it. And there's a number of corpses here. We can talk to the uh, other Dendro Ohor, Gisse. 
The short, squat woman rakes absently the swollen red tattoos decorating her pale, naked scalp. Her claws draw blood, but she doesn't seem to notice. Her head jerks up at the sound of your footsteps. Her too large mouth widens in a sharp-toothed smile. We greet you, Tenderling. Yes, we honor your arrival. Her eyes rove over your body hungrily. What brings you to the dendro of her, hm? What do you wish to share with us? Her gray and pointed tongue swipes at the ritual scarring around her lips, leaving a glistening sheet of saliva. I have some questions about the Dendra Ohur. No, she chuckles, then covering her mouth with the bar claw. No, we are not the voice of the Dendra Ohur, Tenderling. Speak with our leader, Mbitu, instead. Savor his words and drink of his thoughts. She gestures extravagantly in the direction of an elderly man standing nearby as though introducing a prince. Who are you? We are Gisei of the... She pauses. You may not know the word, but we come from another world. they are visitants. A heavier one. More rocks and less life. She rubs her tattoos, drawing your attention to them once more. They are more than decorative. Their shape and placement indicate familiar or tribal ties. Are those clan tattoos or family? Her massive grin nearly splits her face. Both, she says. We mark ourselves for each body we consume. Like twigs spouting from a branch. Everyone in our world is family. Everyone is food. Our world is not like yours, she says. It is not so rich. There are no animals. No, she pauses, frowning. Vegetals? No, none of this. The only flesh is our flesh, she sighs. But we are blessed. When we eat bodies, nothing is lost except the corpse. The soul is preserved, she spreads her hand. The dead one becomes part of us. It becomes we. Makes me wonder if their d particular dimension doesn't have thermodynamics as well, <laughs> since you'd think the inner custom of everything being one species and then consuming each other would be self-defeating. Also, probably not the greatest for the evolution of bacteria. One of the reasons why a lot of animals don't commit um, acts of cannibalism, in fact, most don't in nature, is because of um, the spread of diseases down through the food chain and the accumulation of things like mercury and stuff building up. Um generation to generation, but it does happen where food is scarce on islands. Another thing um, that's interesting about these guys is, so apparently, I've learned something, apparently it suggests here that all of the Dendra Ohur are visitants from another world, and that that is what their power is derived from, their alien physiology rather than um, some sort of Numenera that they have uncovered and used. And uh, it's interesting to me here, again, on the sort of simulationist perspective, these things are so disgusting that, uh, again, nobody would seem to tolerate them. But um, for them, it has a purpose, and they found a place within the economy um, to sort of slide in. But it's also connected to a whole philosophy here, and it descends from a sort of unique ecology. You're saying that the individual dies, but the soul is dispersed among all who eat the body? You are correct, she says, nodding. We give our respect in this way, and we survive. She shrugs, until we don't. And sometimes, someone dies on their own, and the soul is lost. Our people deserve better. That is why we are here. We hear, heard, rumors of the Dendra Ohur magic, she says, concentrating. Your language's tenses clearly give her trouble. It does not stop at the soul. It pulls memories from the dead flesh and soaks them into the mind. She gives you a rapturous smile. So we come, came through a portal in the bloom to learn this magic. We've found our way to Sagus. We asked to join. Ah, yes, and no, that is another thing. It is Dendro or magic, so it's not um, purely, I think, on the basis of visitants and so forth. What is happening, however, is that visitants find their way here into a place that is so disgusting and sort of um, taboo that, you know, if you're a visitant or a mutant, you might be drawn to it anyway, since there's no additional disadvantage of joining, and the people here might be a little bit more understanding and welcoming than they would be otherwise. How many bodies have you eaten? Oh, she came through a portal in the balloon, but the portal is gone, we hear. We will make another, in time. How many bodies have you eaten? We do not share this, she chuckles. We prefer our feasts to be private. But many, many, we find our feasts on our own. We will miss you, Tenderling, all of you. Let's talk to Kiyatawa. 
This woman watches you, measuring every step, every twitch of your hands, and yet there is no fear in her. Iron lines her spine and presses her mouth into a thin, even line. You take a wrong turn, she says, studying the nails in her right hand. Don't see many people down here for the light of the company. She steals a cautious glance at the hulking cultist nearby and returns her gaze to you. You want something? Her eyebrows arch curiously, and has that simple movement that makes a strange connection to your mind. You've seen that expression before on somewhat similar face. The ghostly woman in the fifth eye. Making a note. Go on, she sighs. How long have you been a Dendra Ohur? Long enough, she says. Thought I'd found a place I belonged. Guess I was wrong. She falls silent. Her lips shape the word again. She thinks, how many false families until I find my true one? Why don't you feel like you belong in the Dendro Ohur? I... She exhales, crushing her eyelids shut. Never mind. I shouldn't have said anything. What's bothering you? Nothing. No offense, but I don't know you at all. Leave me alone, all right? And let's talk to Mallet over here. The burly man sneers at you, flexing massive, scarred hands that could easily encircle your throat. His tongue probes his stained, sharpened teeth, and a short, blood-stained club swings from a hook at his waist. So what are you doing down here, shul meat, he says. Playing in the dark, he chuckles, long and low. Mallet, Tyver mutters through a frozen grin. This nub slab beat his partner to death over two shins. Tiber thinks, and I'm the one who turned him in. Can't trust him farther than you can throw him, or even push him. <laughs> Let's make small talk with the man. Have you been a part of the Dendro Hur for long? No, not long, he says. What sort of work did you do before? I broke stuff, he says, his eyes gleaming with dull humor. And don't think I don't recognize you, he says, looking over at Tiber. I remember you, and what you did. What I did, Typer says, scratching his jaw. What I did. Oh, you're talking about how I told everyone you killed your partner for less than a cost of dinner. He smiles, but his eyes are cold. I'd do it again, and for free. Doesn't matter, Mallet shrugs. None of that stuff matters anymore. This is my place now. He thinks, I don't do that anymore. Not for revenge, anyway. Tell me about the Dendra Ohur. Don't have to tell you nothing, he says, snorting. You ain't one of us. You ain't nobody. You want a tour, you talk to Mbidu. I'm busy. I'll do that now. Good. I'm ready. Uh, I think first, let's interact with this body over here. A strong aroma of charred flesh rises from the dingy cloth over this corpse. It's Updated shroud. my journal. You carefully move the shroud to the side. There's no way around it. This dead man was a cast-off and it would be hard for him to be deader. His flesh is papery, desiccated. His tattoo, or rather the charred remains of it, has burned through his skin and into the bone beneath. And of course there is the matter of his charred eye sockets and his horrified, gaping mouth. Parts of the corpse are missing, remnants of an absorbed dendra feast. You aren't surprised they stopped. So we're seeing again evidence of the relationship between the sorrow and the changing god and something that he did in his past that created the sorrow. Presumably, that is also the source of his longevity. When the sorrow caught him, it resulted in his tattoo burning, perhaps through his skin. Let's touch the tattoo. And it hurts, but it was worth it. The last thing you remember before your fingertip grazes the tattoo is a rising buzz. Time stutters and breaks. Panting softly, you awaken, leaning against the beer for support. Your arm burns, your temples throb, and white static claws at the corners of your vision. Someone was screaming in that lightless, timeless void. You remember that much. But it wasn't you. None of the dendra are looking your way. If we examine it again, do we notice anything new? No. Let's leave the corpse alone. And talk to Mbitu. At first glance, it would be easy to assume that this man is dying of some wasting disease or starvation. He is little more than a too-tall skeleton wrapped in translucent flesh and a tattered robe. His hands are essentially bony claws, and yet he beams at you, his sunken eyes glittering with suppressed laughter and feverish life. Tread carefully, dear, Callistage murmur, and B2 is friendly enough, but he's also intelligent, frighteningly so. Do not try to lie to him. Mbitu smiles. His teeth are a muddy brown. 
I know you, he says. So many eyes have lingered on that tattoo, that noble brow he reaches to your forehead with a shivering skeletal finger. Let's let him touch our forehead. His fingertip traces a hot line over your tattoo. Yes, he says. Now I remember. Old Sirisa once saw you out of the corner of her eye, a week before his accident. Lorimar sold you a small bag of... He breathes, closing his eyes. Sugar-dusted almonds. But those aren't the only two. No, you drift through countless lives, altering and ending them, never leaving a name. He draws in his breath. Oh, I can't stand mysteries. Love them, but can't stand them. Who are you? Hmm. I have a choice here, and it's a difficult one for me. Um, I have to weigh the strategic cost of telling people who I am. And there is a cost. I mean, it's the same as I said before in Fallout and not wanting to tell people that you're from a vault, you know, filled with riches. The changing god has enemies. Um, and even telling people that we are a cast-off might, might draw unwanted attention. However, we may also reveal more information, and for me, uh, that trumps everything else. Also, Calistage has warned us not to lie, so we're going to go with choice number one. I am not the man you think I am. That was someone else. Also, the fact that it was a lie also further, I think, puts to rest um, the theory that we are, in fact, the changing god, but just with amnesia this time and not a fact to cast off. No, I think the fact that it was a lie um, also further confirms the overwhelming support for the fact that we are, yes, a cast off. Hmm, and B2 says, the same face, the same tattoo, but yes, different eyes. Perhaps you have a secret twin. He coughs gently against the back of his hand. <coughs> so it brings you to the chapel of the Dendra Ohur, he thinks. So he returns, cast off. What happened this time, I wonder? A sculptor told me that your people may have found a man killed by a strange cr creature. Yes, he says, I believe I know the poor man. Dry as a leaf, hollow as an eggshell, barely any mind left in there at all clucks his tongue. Inspect him at your leisure. He's the one with the charred skin on his brow. That. I don't know much more about him, he says, chuckling, though I can assure you we plumbed the depths of his mind and body for answers, but I seem to recall seeing him before, possibly not through my eyes, mind you, in Cliff's Edge. He was coming out of a building near the Churgical Parlor. Tell me about your cult. We worship the great queen Sarlavan, lady of maggots, goddess of entropy, and guardian of the empty barrier, he says, then pauses, tapping the muddy truth thoughtfully, although worship is the wrong word, perhaps. He points to the altar nearby. It displays a skull with flat, unforgiving eyes, buried in its hollow sockets. We talked about thermodynamics before, and it's interesting that they worship a goddess of entropy, because in the act of preserving anyone, they're sort of fighting against entropy, you would say but perhaps the goddess doesn't mind and grants them this special favor. She waits on the other side of death with her billions of squirming children. They devour whatever passes into their realm, and rightfully so. Everyone must eat. His eyes twinkle fondly. But whatever she and her children eat is lost forever. And so the Dendra Ohur work to preserve the minds and the mysteries of mortals before death claims them. We hold their shrill little thoughts in our minds and let them tumble around as they will. He shivers. It feels marvelous. Tell me about yourself. Oh, there isn't much to tell. I spent most of my years in this little chapel, he says, casting a fond look around. The Dendro Ohur has rather consumed my life. He thinks, ha, oh, consumed my... I'll have to remember that one. Why did you join the Dendro Ohur? Well, that is a good question. A very good question. I congratulate you on asking it. He rubs his hand together with a papery sound. I am afraid, however, that outsiders rarely understand what calls us to the Dendro Uhur, so with apologies, I do not think I will answer. I want to ask about something else. On to more interesting topics than an old man's past, he says, flashing a stained grin. Lovely. I have some questions about the Dendro Uhur. Lovely, he says. This may surprise you, but we rarely get curious visitors. Most people seem quite nervous about us. He wets his cracked lips and awaits your questions with polite interest. <laughs> I can't imagine why. What does your cult's name mean, anyway? The old man's eyes dart from side to side, and he leans in. Nobody knows, he whispers, delighted. It's a mystery. Isn't that wonderful? 
How long have the Dendro Ahur existed? Centuries, he declares, though how many I couldn't say. We aren't devoted to paper records, as you might imagine. We prefer keeping them in our heads. He runs his tongue along the edge of his rotting teeth. Also, and this is slightly embarrassing, none of us managed to eat our founder. He simply disappeared one day. Can you imagine? Who founded your cult? A man named Melmoth Loverum. He says and sighs. I do not wish one of us had. Ma I do wish one of us had managed to eat him. How do you preserve humanity's knowledge? Oh, I thought everyone knew that. He says, surprised. We eat the flesh and organs of corpses to assimilate their minds. Then he trails off, noticing your expression. What? I was more interested in the process than your methods. That is disgusting. Nothing. I'm grateful to you. Humanity's greatest achievement shouldn't be forgotten. Well, we could learn more about the process, and so doing might learn some useful tidbit that we can learn later. Three, I think, probably suits my character more, but we're going to go with two. Ah, fellow scholar, he says. Well, it's quite simple and impossibly complex at the same time. He points to the various hoses and chambers adorning his robes. We do not chew on the corpses, of course. That would be quite messy. And lethal, most likely. Humans are a diseased bunch. Our suits liquefy dead flesh, extracting the information contained within. When we feed upon this uh, enriched flesh, it becomes part of us. So it is, once again, Numenera-driven and not um, visitant-driven, as I might have thought. Though who knows what their technology originally came from. At any rate, we scour the streets for bodies uh, left unclaimed. We bring them here and lay them upon the biers. His sweeping hand directs your attention to the still, shrouded figures lying about the chamber. When the body is ripe with unplucked secrets, we gather about it and taste it together. But a lifetime of thoughts flit about ours like little fish. He smacks his lips happily. Interesting. <laughs> what else is there to say? Oh, it is, he says, and dangerous, of course. It does or drive us all the slightest bit mad. He purses his lips now that he's given away a naughty secret, but it's worth it, even so. Farewell. In this world, then. So we have um, examples of all the different sorts of things that might come to uh, a cult like this. It, it follows the pattern that I love so much of Torment, where it starts out with something fantastic and out of this world, and while you don't receive a sort of scientific mechanical explanation of how it works, what you do receive is the impact and the influence. It's that that Torment expresses its simulationist tendencies. You've got this new technology that lets you break down people's memories and break down their bodies and let their memories pass into you. And so what are the consequences of that? Well, first of all, it's disgusting, that much is obvious, but it's also powerful and can be made to serve a purpose. So an entire institution has cropped up around it. It calls itself a cult, of course. Um, and we found uh, there's a lot of cults, <laughs> aren't there, in this game. There's at least two officially recognized ones in the city, this one and the Cult of the Changing God, that both have cult in the title. And the Order of Truth here has a statue of their founder built outside. Uh, so, apparently here, and in this period, a cult, and the word itself, doesn't carry the same sort of negative connotation. And in this cult, we see all the examples of what the sort of effects of this cult might be. Um, it's a place to provide shelter for visitants in the case of Gisei, also Don't for criminals like me. Mallet. I have my sisters to keep me occupied. Um, all the p sorts of people that might be considered unsavory otherwise are able to find a home here and it that is able to keep them safe. We also even have people who are not necessarily fleeing from the law, but people like Kiyotawa, who just feel as if they don't belong and are searching for a sort of family. Perhaps he'll try the cult of the changing god first. And then, of course, Devourer of Wrongs, who is the representation of sort of the, the raison d'etre, the reason why the cult is able to sort of maintain itself, the expression of the law. So... Let's take another look at the body and see if we can find out any new information now that we've gotten permission to look at it. No, I don't think so. So we got everything that we needed here. I want to check to see what we got from that, from the Sorrow's Prey. We've completed this. 
found the victim's corpse but a familiar looking tattoo. Perhaps one of the Dendro Ahur can tell me more. Okay. So now that I've looked at it, perhaps one of these people will have more to say about it. Um, I don't think it would be in B2. Because I sort of I thought I exhausted all the conversation options with him. Let's let's take a look at Kiwata. We need to find the one that tried to um, consume it before. She doesn't spare words on you this time. She merely nods, her wary gaze cataloging the position of everyone in the room. What's bothering you? Nothing. No offense. Okay. So we didn't get an, a new option to talk there. Let's get to say. Nope, no new option there. Devour of wrongs. Wonder if he would be the one. Nope. Maybe Mallet might have been the one to do the consumption. And if not, then it's almost certainly going to be in B2. Nope. Okay, let's see what in B2 has to say then. Some more questions about the Dender Ohur. What's the purpose? Again, again, again. Nothing. Something about your life. Nope. Huh. That's odd. Perhaps we didn't discover the critical piece uh, that we need. But, anyways, since I'm here, let's take a look at... Uh, this altar is made entirely of human bones, with a carved skeletal head mounted above. Live maggots wriggle in its empty eye sockets. So, with an absence of anything else to do with this corpse, I'm going to leave for now. On it. Let's see here. I'll take a look at Ash and Imitation. Let's see, one, a two, a three. Okay, so we've gotten what we need in terms of these three. And now we can visit the fourth Ashen Invitation. I'm going to say we need to get to Government Square. So we need to go to the west. Let's spend around this way. Past these wonderful... I just also, again, just love the sort of transition from the more classic fantasy above to the steampunky, hellish industrialist landscape we see in the underbelly. Let's head upstairs. This is actually the ladder, believe it or not. It opens before us. Yes, child. So she mentioned someone, a military person, the ghost did, inside of the labyrinth. And that person is here, Sigan. This woman is dressed much like the levies who flank her, but unlike them, her expression is sober and alert. Her hair is cut short, the corner of her eyes wrinkled with crow's feet. A little swarm of mechanical drones circles about her, buzzing messages in her ears. She whispers replies in return, and every so often one of them whisks away, disappearing into the city. What is it, citizen? She pauses, eyes darting to your tattoo, then to your face. No, you're the one they call a Don. I heard you were in the city. You sense a sudden wariness in here. It's been ten years since your last visit. I was too young to know you then, but the drones remember. What do the drones remember about me? On cue, two of her attendant drones dip close to her ear, emitting a stream of raspy noise that might be some sort of language. You kept to your own affairs, but everywhere you went, the city held its breath. People deferred to you, even the ones with power and influence. You looked the same as you do now, exactly the same. I want to know why, and if you don't mind telling me, I want to know what you're doing in Sagus now. She thinks, the stories they tell me are troubling, I'll have to keep an eye on him. Hmm. We have to weigh our options carefully. Um, <laughs> I don't want to tell her that we're not a Dawn because I want to follow what it happened in Planescape, where if you lie about a Dawn enough, it actually created an NPC called Dawn. I'm hoping something like that happens here. I don't know for sure. Um, but the Changing God is a troublemaker. If we impersonate him, um, 
which is the captain of the guard could end up being a powerful surveillance enemy of us. However, if we tell her uh, I'm trying to escape a creature that's hunting me, we might end up, she might end up helping us at the end. Smoking tendrils, grasping talons, a, to a towering nebulous shape. She sees the look on your face and nods. I've seen it, but only through the eyes of a drone. Not long ago, it killed a man in the streets, a man with the same mark you bear. If anyone else knew, there'd be panic, even if it's only hunting people like you. I haven't told anyone, not even the council. Another drone swoops past you, stopping just short of the woman's head. It unleashes a series of raspy buzzes and squawks. She whispers something to it, then glances back in your direction. What was it you wanted? As she turns her face back from the drone, something about her profile strikes you as familiar. At that moment, she looks much like the ghostly girl you met in the Fifth Eye, and that they could be the same person, though this woman seems twenty years older, at least. Who are you? Sigan, captain of the levies. I'm not a levy myself, but I command them. You look a lot like someone I met in the Fifth Eye. She laughs aloud. In that moment, her voice is clear and rich, like that of a much younger woman, or even a teenage girl. Was she a scared, peltast, welded to, wedded to her blade, fresh from the endless battle? She thinks God's about. It's another one. Another one of us. Hmm. Actually, she was young, with a chorus of whispering voices all around her. Her face grows pale. Then I know who she was. She was the woman who, hunt who haunted me when I was a girl. The woman I was supposed to become. I'll remember that. For as long as I can remember, I felt as though this other woman was taking shape inside me. When I was a girl, I'd gaze at myself in the looking glass, and every day I seemed less like me and more like her. I don't remember when I abandoned my family, but it couldn't have been more than ten or twelve. They seemed like strangers to me. I couldn't even remember who they were. I started hearing stories about the other girls like me. Older girls, younger girls. I sought them out, learned everything that I could. All the ones I met went mad, and I never survived past their twentieth year. It wasn't always the same death. Sometimes it was sickness, or an accident, or they ended their own lives, but somehow they always died. It was fate, and it was mine too. But you survived. I cheated, she's silent for a moment. When I was old enough to become a citizen, I sa to sacrifice a year to create a levy. I went straight to the Order of Truth, and I told them I wanted to donate as many years as I could. I didn't think it would work, she confided, but what choice did I have? When they started taking the first few years, and I aged closer to twenty, each time I thought I would die. And the levy that was born from my twentieth year, it was a monster. So interestingly enough, um, the process that creates levies when it subtracts your life it doesn't shift the date of your death closer. It doesn't impact your health. It actually physically ages you forward in time. They tried to make me stop, but I refused. I made them go on. I burned through my twenties and beyond, but with every year I lost, I felt that other woman inside me weakening, pleading, dying. I laughed as they burned the years away. When I walked into the Order of Truth, I was a teenaged girl. When I walked out a few hours later, I was a middle-aged woman. But I was free. How long has this been happening to women in the city? Centuries, I think. The earliest reference I could find was around the time of Chula, but it probably goes back further than that. There was an Aeon priest about 80 years ago. He thought he'd make a name for himself by discovering the cause. Not the only ex women in Segas, never in the outlying villages. I thought it might be caused by some kind of Numenera underneath the city, but he was never able to prove anything. You said the levy born from your 20th year was a monster? It was death. Not death the way it's personified in stories, but death like it really is. A bloated thing with festering sores, vomiting blood and butt and pus and excrement from every orifice. Even the Aeon priests were terrified. They burned it to a pile of ash. So how old are you, really? 22. That's why I was too young to remember you when you were here last. I was a 20-year-old girl, a runaway, half-mad, and living in the streets. So, what I think has happened here is that she advanced past the age of what the ghost was. The ghost was a woman who died, died young, and um, 
the machines were an effort to put her into the bodies. So, by aging past, she sort of invalidated herself as an appropriate vessel, but everybody else, by the time they reach that age, the creature inhabits, in, uh, inhabits them. Except, interestingly enough, that one girl we met, I said she had enormously strong will before. Loss of self is succumbing. This captain would have. And she had to, you know, you would imagine someone like this, the captain of the guard, being someone incredibly strong-willed. And not even she was as strong-willed as the woman we, as the young girl that we encountered. She wasn't able to fight it off. She had to find another solution. Let's talk about something else. What were you saying to those drones? They carry my orders to levees all over the city, and they bring reports from the levees back to me. She reaches out a hand, and one of the drones buzzes something unintelligible. A few years ago, the Aeon priest found them buried underground and brought them back to life. I learned their language, and so our conversations are safe from prying ears. Farewell. Farewell to you, whoever you really are. So, we've spoken to every one of the women um, around Sega's Cliffs, who were trying to be possessed. Um, so, it makes me wonder if uh, we have anything new in our journal's results. Okay, so I think it's time now that we return to the calm to speak to the ghostly woman. We've encountered more of our memories, and because of the nature of that being a shared space with um, our memories and hers, uh, she may have more information for us now to know how to proceed. But the question is this, how do we get back to the calm? When we woke up in uh, the fifth eye before, the ghost was gone. She's now physically inside of um, the calm and not in the fifth eye anymore, so we can't have her strangle us again. Um, so we need a way to get back there. Um, I suppose we could just hurl ourselves off a cliff or something, but if we completely obliterated our body, that might obliterate the cliff as well. It might be too much for us to regenerate from. We need another one, and we need to get to the caravan Sarai to do it. Yes. Here I come! Yes, indeed. All right. I'm so, done. there is a inn here. The innkeeper has the name of Tranquility. Let's talk to her. A woman as tall and graceful as Willow steps forward to greet you. She bows, then looks down at you with warm, gold-flecked eyes. Welcome, she says, to Tranquility's Rest. I am the proprietress, Tranquility. Are you looking for a place to take your ease? As she speaks, a sense of delicious calm comes over you, and you find yourself wanting to agree with her. There's nothing you'd like better right now than the peace and solitude of a quiet room. With our perception, we notice that we begin to wonder if the sense of peace that surrounds Tranquility has something to do with the way she speaks. Her voice is low and rich, and she appears to be modulating it in some way. The technique is subtle, but the effect is profound, calming you and making you feel a little sleepy. Tell me about Tranquility's rest. She smiles. It's the most peaceful inn in Sega's Cliffs, with the most beautiful views. All the rooms faced outwards, so that the bustle of the caravan Sarai is invisible and inaudible. All you see is sky and sea, and the roofs of the city far below you. And all you hear is the breeze. I am the sole owner, and I have been offering solitude, security, and discretion to travelers for twenty years. You will never have as sound a night's sleep as you will when you stay here. Forgive me for asking, but are you human? She laughs melodiously. <laughs> no need for apologies. Given my height, it's a natural question. I am indeed human. A human mutant, and fortunate to live, and fortunate to live in Sega's Cliffs, where that is not a crime. There are very few places in this world where someone like me would even be allowed to clean a hostel, let alone own one. You're using your tone of voice to calm me. Is that something you learned? She raises her eyebrows. Very few people notice that. Well done. 
I am indeed manipulating my voice. When I opened this place, I wanted to make it the most relaxing hostel in the Ninth World, and I worked to make every aspect of it soothing, even my voice. She smiles mysteriously. Another talent of mine has been helpful as well. Could you use your calming abilities to put me into a trance? She looks bemused. No one has ever asked me something like this before. Normally I would refuse for fear of some complication and perhaps retaliation for that. But I sense a certain affinity between us, a kindness we share. I wonder if that has to do with the ties and stuff. I don't think any harm will come of it. If you feel it will help you, I will do it. She reaches out to you. Now take my hands and close your eyes. As you take her hands, a scent like baking bread and honey overwhelms you, and she begins to sing in a soft but resonant contralto. The melody fills your head, making it heavy with slumber, and so that your chin drops to your chest. You feel like you're being lowered gently into a warm bath. The water closes over your head, but there's no fear of drowning. You have returned to the womb, where all is comforting darkness and the steady pulse of a beating heart. Like that, we find ourselves back in the calm. A spectre says, You're looking, hmm, a lot more well rested than you usually do. <laughs> There's nothing new yes. to say to us, so now. I'm going to head right over to the portal. Go ahead back into the labyrinth here and speak to the ghostly yes. woman. Now. And there's something new. Ready. Check the ghostly woman first and see what she makes of this new development. Look! You follow her finger to a glowing form where you before there was nothing. It's a membra. You found one of them already. A woman created by the engine. Very well, let's talk to Avina. I believe Avina was the young girl with the flute. Siege, the ghostly woman says, watching the scene in front of you. I remember the siege when the Tabat came to destroy Sega's cliffs. You remember it? I think it happened a long time ago. Did it? I'm only a broken memory, apparently. What do I know of time? A wry smile plays on her lips. After a long, quiet moment, she nods as though coming to a decision. I was there. I remember the screams, the terror. The Dabat came, many of them mounted on their dragoliths, each of them with a stranger, more terrifying weapon than the one before. Sega should have fallen, like Xuanhua and Ika and a hundred villages before us, but we didn't. We fought them off. It's coming back to me, she thinks. These are my memories. She shakes her head. But what does that have to do with the other women? I don't know. There's more to the story, but I need your help to find it. Yes. Now. <laughs> and the expression of a scene here is that the bot punching these poor Sega's towns people over and over and over. Poor bastards. This is all just a memory, but the heat from the rubble as well as the smell of burning wood and flesh feels very real. So, this originally took place during the siege. And we'll talk to Loss of Self. The ghostly woman's eyes grow white, wide at the scene in front of you. That's me. I remember now. The siege ended, the Tabat were driven back, and I was among the survivors, but... She places a hand on the surface of the chamber. I didn't exactly survive. One of the Tabat's weapons made me sick somehow, in my mind. My father was an explorer and a tinkerer. He knew something about the Numenera. He put me in there to protect me. But the Aeon priests and the Trojans couldn't help me. No one could. My father kept me in stasis until a cure could be found. She gazes into the distance, as though trying to remember something. Are the women the result of some attempted cure? I don't know. Please, we're so close. Keep looking so we can find the answer. If there's anything to examine here, we can examine the chamber. She looks so real. 
Her chest moves up and down with each breath. It's strange to see the ghostly woman both inside and outside this chamber. And the machine. These machines make no sounds or motion at all. Like the other machines here, they seem to be just a facade. Ready. And we can talk to Kiyotawa. A translucent man appears. He is unfamiliar to you, but he seems to be working on the machine. The ghostly woman watches him, her brow furrowed. I know him. The engine. He's... Is that machine the source of all this? Yes. I don't know how he figured it out, but he knew enough to turn it on. I think he's my father, she tilts her head. The memories of this place must be fuzzy. He doesn't look right, but he feels right. I'm certain it's him. She reaches out for the translucent figure, but her hand goes right through him. She calls out, Father? Father! The man continues his work as though she weren't there. The ghostly woman sags. I'm invisible to him. You! She places a solid hand on your shoulder, her eyes suddenly lit. He used that machine, that probability engine, to recreate me and another woman. This machine is but a memory, but the engine exists in the real world. I know it. She looks at the ghostly man. Speak to him. Find out how to turn it off. Then you can do the same thing in the real world and end this. I'll remember that. Is there anything over here? I think there was a place that we can uncover there, but we haven't yet. We can talk to the ghostly man, or we can talk to Sigan. Let's unlock everything and talk to Sigan first. Incidentally, you may have serious suspicions about the identity of the ghostly man. We'll talk a little bit about that later. The machines in the stasis chamber are transformed into shattered, smoking wrecks. The ghostly woman laughs the first time you've heard her do so, though the humor in it is dubious. I died. I remember it now. I never survived the stasis chamber, and the probability engines were his vain attempt to resurrect me. Making a note. She looks sadly at the translucent man representing her father. He doesn't know. He thinks he can save me, but he's lost me forever. Tell him. Tell him that he can never get me back, not the real me. What's left of this woman inside is unrecognizable and smells too real for your taste. Of course. The air is warm next to this machine, and you feel dizzy whenever you go near it. I'm going to save the game, and let's talk to the ghostly man. The ghostly woman's father works frantically, turning dials, metal, stripping metal wires, attaching and detaching various pieces within the machine. After each change, he places a hand on the side of the machine, speaks some words, and gestures in the air. He doesn't seem to notice you at all. Can I help you? No, he says, but he doesn't appear to be speaking to you. It's not right. Her hair was softer, thinner, her eyes more like caramel. He speaks to the machine again, swipes through the air rapidly, then sticks his hand inside the engine and rearranges several delicate parts. I'd really like to help you. He continues his work, completely oblivious to you. Well, we've got to tell him. I need to know how to turn the machine off. What? He whirls around, his eyes bright with fury. Turn it off? That would kill her. Kill her, do you understand? I'm so close to bringing her back. It's just a matter of tuning the machine correctly. His face darkens. I won't shut it down, and you will not force me. Although he makes no signal or gesture, the bot soldiers from other side of the Fathom run to his aid. Somehow, this ghostly construct's anger has summoned him. Leave. The platform rumbles with the power and pain of his cry. Leave me alone. You will not uh, take what's left of my daughter from me. Hmm. So, we can attack and start a crisis if we wanted to. We're alone here, though. And those Tabat are badass. This is a difficult fight. They actually had to uh, make it easier somewhat from the beta. Um, this is also an example of why it's good to have a lot of these skills duplicated yourself, even though we're traveling with Tiber and he's very good at persuasion, he's not here to persuade for us now. And there are even other conversations where even if Tiber is, is present, you will have to be the one that does the persuading. So let's try and use our persuasion and say, don't you understand, your real daughter is dead. Even with a machine, you can never truly have her back. I'm going to spend a lot here, since the consequences of failure are rather steep, even though, um, however, we don't have the persuasion skill yet. 
I plan to pick it up when I can, and our chance of failure is significant. But we succeed. Wonderful. Because I think if we failed, that was our last chance to avoid the fight. No, no, my daughter is. He starts to point at the ghostly woman, then takes a closer look at her. Are you truly dead? I am not your daughter, the ghostly woman says. She is gone forever. He looks between you and her, despair growing on his face. Finally, his shoulders sag. Updated my journal. Despondently, he says, watch. He places his hands on the side of the engine and says the word, Neshu. Suddenly, a glowing interface appears in the air. He presses five symbols in a specific sequence. He performs the ritual a second time, and then the machine grows quiet and dim. The ghostly man begins to fade. To the woman, he says, I only want to set things right. Then he is gone. Very much like Torment with this. A lot of the stuff that we saw with Dianara. You know, his even his best efforts creating, you know, pain and, well, frankly, <laughs> torment to you know, others. It's like the ghostly woman. He told you how to shut off the engine. Go, turn them off before it gets any worse. Well, here's a big question. Where do I find the probability engine in the real world? I'll remember that. I don't know, but it looks like that, I'm sure of it. She points to the probability engine nearby. Keep looking. I know it's there somewhere. It must be hidden if it's still doing its work. Look underneath the city. There are thousands of buried secrets there. Okay. Take another look at the chamber. Yes. See if there's any clues we can deduce. But no. No. No, nothing new there. All right. Let's Time go. to go back to the world outside. Let's go. So I think that there's a couple of things that I need to check on. Thank you. Um, supposedly when you talk to the leader of the Dendro over in the chapel, he's supposed to tell you about the rubble outside the Churgical Parlor. And uh, from Not there, you. then, once you've done that, you can actually en it enables you to search through the pile, which gives you a critical clue. Um, I wonder if one of the things that we talked about with him accomplished that already. As far as, I, I don't think there's a direct line back to the underbelly, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through Cliff's Edge, just to double check to see if we can, um, no, no, I'm going to go back to I'm the going. underbelly first. And while I'm there, I'm going to check with the Dendro Herd just to see if there's a new line of dialogue there. And if not, I'm just going to go straight back to uh, Cliff's Edge and see if we can interact with the, uh, the cliff face now. So let's go down this flight of stairs here. This will take us back to the underbelly. And we're going to head... I think we'll head first to Mapper. Yes. Because I believe he's on the way. This gentleman here. From a distance, it looks as if this mutant is wearing a form-fitting suit of finely patterned lines in white, yellow, and pale blue. On closer examination, it becomes apparent that these are tattoos and that they cover nearly the entirety of his body, even a shaved head. His actual clothes are simple and worn, and his boots look as though they have seen hard use. He is studying the meaningless swirls and whirls on his arms and mouthing names that mean nothing to you. Solvi, Bent, Ergal, Tentris. When he looks up at you, you see that a strange device covers one of his eyes. A deep blue light shines in its center and seems to measure and evaluate you as he focuses on you. It's a heads-up display. He smiles as he approaches a broad, beaming grin that he considers you a friend already. I'm Mapper, he says, extending his hand. He thinks, a new face. New faces mean new places. I've been everywhere around here. I found my way into places long sealed and best forgotten. Met all sorts of people. Friends. Can't say I cared much for some of them, it's true. His voice is fast and insistent, insistent and incisive. Still, I try. The communities of our world are islands of light. Sometimes they wink out and sometimes they flare up. I want to link them together. I want to be a bridge. You say you want to be a bridge? How do you even do that? He shrugs, a faint smile on his lips. I travel, I see places, I map them out on my skin. And maybe inside me, I don't know. 
I mean, the lines change when I look, and they've got to be stored someplace, right? He scratches his bald head. The lines flow under his fingers. I just want to collect places. I need to know that I... Gaps is all I know. It's all I want to know. So, loss is obviously a profound and recurring theme in Torment. We've got the Dendro who are preserving things in our own way. This man acts very much like them by tattooing locations on his skin rather than preserving the memories of people. And there, of course, is the lost memories of the woman we are pursuing that the act of attempting to preserve has created so, many, so much trouble in Sega's clips. Where did you get all those tattoos? These? These are not tattoos, they're maps. He exposes a shiny grin. Maps of places I have been or heard of. He covers the artificial eye with his hands and says, If I look at my skin like this, it's meaningless. Then he uncovers it and says, But if I look at it like this, suddenly, I see the map. Springing up off my skin, I focus on it, it all comes clear. Buildings, people, smells, even a route to get there. It's worthless to anyone else, of course, without me to interpret the map. It's a combination of my mutation and the lens. Finding the eyepiece was the best part of being born like this. He sighs content contentedly. <laughs> it makes me feel like my life has made sense at last, and that, my friend, is far more luck than anyone deserves. Where have you been? He laughs. <laughs> it's probably easier to ask where I haven't been. All over the Sagus Protectorus, the oasis of Marjolias, the Valley of Dead Heroes, Colne Village, the ruins of Arco Pelagia, and all around the Black Cube, Tower of Birds, where the third loss fell, even up the path of the clock of Kala to Vralk. As he speak as he speaks, the lines of his body shift and move, coming into prominence with the words. Every piece was a treat, an experience. Did you know most people never go more than fifty kilometers from the village of their birth, if that? I've been tremendously lucky, my friends. He smiles down at his maps. Then he looks back at you and says, more quietly, If you plan to travel, I'd avoid the grasslands, though. The birds will take your meat for their meals, and your bones for their nests. Tell me again about why, about what you do, why you are the way you are. I'm just repeating all these because... Here we go. Can you tell me about the places you've been again? He looks down at his stomach, and a smiling gaze falls upon the lines. They start to flow and writhe. Too many to count. Memories stack and overflow. But the maps paint the territory, make each place distinct, join the world together. Like Frolk here, a place of the blasted serpents, vicious plants, and evil people. Still, it has its own twisted beauty. Or take the oasis, the water bubble in the middle of the lost sea. His eyes lose their focus. I can see them even now. Shit. See, he's supposed to tell us <laughs> look now, and he's not. I'm going to have to look that up. But for the time being, um, I am going to look back in the Dendro Horror Chapel. I'm just going to have a brief conversation, see if we can squeeze yes. another piece of information out of the guy. Who is running this place about the body? Without doubt. Questions about the Dendro Her? Nope. Some more questions about your life. Did you join? Want to know more about what drew you? Nope. Yes. And as I know from looking about this before, there's nothing new to be discovered here. Hmm. Well, I suppose I can try as a sort of last act Fine. before I kill the stream to go back to Cliff's Edge and see if we can interact with the rubble there. If not, I'm going to have to do a little bit of research to discover how we can proceed on um, the two quests uh, that we are looking at. We have to get the idea, I know, of where to uh, look for the lair of the changing god. Um, I wonder if we can't talk more to the ghostly man. No, because he disappeared, didn't he? Inside there. Do it. 
complete shit. the quest, did it? Just down the probability engine in the real world. The ghostly woman thinks it's hidden somewhere underneath. Well, Mapper is supposed to be the one to tell us, but I wonder if we don't have to complete yet a third quest. So we're like four quests nested now uh, to complete the one up here uh, with the juvenile stitches and people digging around. So we might try that um, as the next thing to do. But let's head back to Cliff's Edge. There we go. It's in the southeast. This head is over done. here and up here. Just to check on the rubble and see if we can Let's poke go. in there now. this is a bug if there wasn't like a bit of dialogue missing from the Dendro Horror, whether or not he told us what we needed to hear and I just plain forgot while I was busy narrating it. But it looks like uh, here, the salty air only partially mutes the cloud of putrid sweetness clinging to this jumble of fallen wood, stone, and iron. Until recently this was someone's home, but the unstable ground must have caused it to collapse. Let's search the rubble for clues. You shift aside broken pieces of furniture and small pieces of rubble, but you find nothing of value. After a short while, you realize what has happened. Someone has already picked through the ruins and taken the more accessible valuables. You stand back, concentrating. Nothing but a pile of stone is familiar, but the view from where this door once stood, a boundless horizon falling into the sea, is... I'll remember that. This appears to be the house where the cast-off once lived, but either he left no clues of his identity, or they were taken by the scavengers. It might be helpful to ask around the area to see if anybody has spotted someone looting this house. Let's use our anamnesis to study the horizon. 80% and we fail. Well, that happens sometimes. We can't retry, but let's uh, try and spend some might to dig through. And thankfully have, we have Mr. Might himself here with us. Hmm. Might is just less valuable and he's got some edge, so I'm perfectly willing to spend two points once I get to 90%. The smell intensifies as you heave aside a slab of ceiling. A swarm of startled insects spins away into the sky, revealing the body of a young woman torn and crushed. An invisible hand rips the air from your chest and the strength from your legs. You fall, feeling a presence close around you, a heat on your back. Who's there? Your words are a whisper. You can barely breathe now, and the heat fills you like a fever. Suddenly, a cool hand covers your burning eyes. A smooth arm folds over your stomach. Making a note. And just like that, the heat is gone. You whirl around. No one is here. But you sense something has changed in the labyrinth. A new reflection is forming. Cool. So, let's speak to these people, because they were here, and they might have noticed somebody trying to rifle through in there. Hello again, beloved Blessel. Have you spoken with Kazmine and Mimion yet? I think someone may have looted that ruined house against the cliff. Did you see who it was? Yes, the cultist says, a mischievous expression crossing her face. But I wonder if I can convince you to share something with us in exchange for our help. She ignores the sort of looks from her fellow cultists. Will you tell us about your birth? Why not? Very well. I awoke miles above the world, falling to my death. You can't be serious, she says, blanching. It's true. Without getting into the particulars, I survived the fall and came to understand myself. Amazing, she says, shaking her head. None of you were lucky enough to wake up in bed, were you? <laughs> she clears her throat. Well, a deal is a I'll deal. I'll remember that. We did see someone looking, lurking around the rubble before you arrived, she says, glancing towards the pile of rubble. Dirty children, orphans perhaps, were digging through the ruins. I believe they took some food and valuables, but we were trying not to stare. Who lived in that ruined house against the cliff? Cultus glances at the others. They shake their heads. A man. But we don't know his name or where he is now. He always took great care to avoid us. So, a cast-off but in the guise of the Changing God, who apparently does not like to interact very much with his, uh, the cult All named right. after him. Maybe it makes him feel uncomfortable. Uh, 
So yes. we know of a group of kids over here, and I said that we would have another opportunity to talk to the girl with the flute. Perhaps two more opportunities. Let's speak to her. Let me ask you something. All right. Someone saw children playing in the ruins of the collapsed house. Was that you? I had a feeling you were smart. Not like most grown-ups. She shrugs. Zeb and I rummaged through the house for something to eat. He got some stale bread and dried fruit, but I found something even better. Here, I'll show you. She pulls out something small out of her pocket. It looks like a metallic cube, but there is something strange about the geometry, as if you weren't quite seeing it in perspective. It's a trick box. I don't know why, but it just felt right when I picked it up. She twists it gently this way and that, but the box remains sealed. You can fairly hear something rattling about inside. I haven't figured out how to open it yet, but I will. Hmm. It's not yours. I have to return it to its rightful owner. I didn't steal it. I found it. She snatches it back, but after a second she slumps and holds it out again. But I guess if it's somebody else's, they should have it. It's for a good cause, I promise you. She sniffs a little as you take the box. Okay. I'll remember that. Pulling her eyes away from the box, she looks at you. Was that... Was that all you wanted? We're going to have yet another opportunity to talk to her, so I think we will talk to her about her house and herself a little bit later. For now, let's examine the quest item that we got. It's an interdimensional puzzle box. This is a small metallic cube recovered from the ruins of a collapsed house in Cliff's Edge. It's etched with tiny symbols, with the means of opening the box. It's not obvious from a cursory visual inspection. Something rattles within. Let's examine it. You raise the cube to eye level and shake it again. Nothing moves within, but once again you hear the rattle of an object trapped inside. Something rough grazes the edges of your thumb, turning the cube sideways you see a finely etched diagram, a labyrinthine network of circuits. It means nothing to you. Perhaps one of the experts in machinery lore in the city may be able to make sense of it. For the heck of it, let's smell it. Beneath the expected greasy stench of metal, you detect salt. The mingled aroma of heated metal and stone. A fearsome stench of nostalgia grips you for a moment, tied to absolutely nothing that you can recall. Squeeze it between your hands. When you press the box between your palms, and it collapses with a satisfying hissing series of clicks, when you let it go, it immediately springs back into seemingly rigid shape. Let's put the box away. So, perhaps we can take it to the Order of Truth and learn a little bit more about it. But we're going to save that for next time. Thank you for watching very much, and uh, I will see you when I stream next. Take care.